So there was an invite sent to everybody uh, to access the materials in this workshop. So this is basically an invite to our training portal. And in there you have the slides, all the vulnerable apps that I'm going to use uh, in the demos today. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, like uh, free access to these forever, right? So even though you get it for free, whenever we update the workshop, you will also have uh, whatever else uh, we add. And you can download the apps and try the exercises on your own. So for example, if today you don't have an Android device or an iOS device, then uh, you can still like do the exercises maybe later on just by following the, the slides and maybe watch the video as well, right? Uh, another thing is if um, we will probably upload this video to YouTube. So if you are on YouTube and you want access to the slides and so on, just email admin at 7 and we will give you access to that for free, right? So just to mention that. So yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm the CEO of 7 Security. If you like this workshop, maybe you like reading public fences reports. So there's a few of those here on the publications. Uh, we have delivered training at Black Hat USA, Hacking the Boss, uh, OWAS Global Apps, Seg, Nulcon, and many other conferences. Um, um, maybe some of you uh, have seen my name in some reports from Q53. I also work for version 1, wrote a course for Elon Security a while back. Uh, I'm one of the project leaders for OWAS OWTF, which is an OWAS flagship project. So if you're unfamiliar with that, you can type OWTF.org in your browser and that will take you there. This is a link to some presentations, and if uh, after the pandemic we meet someday and have a beer or something, uh, I can explain to you how all this certification uh, fun happened. Um, yeah, um, so some of the um, issues that we will see today have to do with uh, Smart Sheriff. Uh, this was an application that was mandated in the entire country of South Korea. So this is the good Korea, right? Not the uh, communist one. So. This is the one, um, yeah, it was kind of interesting, right? So by law, uh, children and parents were forced to install this application. Um, so the idea being that the parent would control like during what times of the day the child would be able to access the phone, um, what kind of applications uh, the child could have installed the phone and things like that, right? So the idea of the application was to help a parent be a parent, basically. But uh, in practice, uh, so this is like the usual political thing, right? To uh, get something approved to save the children. So um, this is what happened. But then in practice, the implementation was really bad. So everything you should not do in a mobile application can be summarized in these two reports. Pretty much every possible mistake was made. It's just horrible uh, security. So you can see those two public pentest reports there. Uh, you can also see the slides and there's a presentation on YouTube that you can uh, watch as well about this. Um, I also gave a presentation about some Chinese government uh, applications that we tested. Uh, these, are, these are more kind of privacy related, not as much security related. And the context here was from human rights activists trying to answer questions like, is the information that the Chinese government gathers about the Muslim minority uh, citizens in Xinjiang, is it a human rights violation or not, right? So we were trying to help them answer uh, those difficult questions. Of course, they were the human rights activists, so they did the, the hard job and we just helped them on the technical side trying to find the evidence, right? So these are more kind of uh, analysis report as opposed to Penta's report, right? And there's a, a bunch of other uh, reports on the website. So all this is available for free and it's a very good way to learn about securities to see uh, what kind of other problems uh, were found in other applications, uh, the recommendations about how to fix those problems, uh, and then how that the, how did the exploit look like and, and so on right so all those things are interesting so we are going to see uh, a lot of um, you know a lot of uh, vulnerabilities uh, in uh, during this workshop uh, which i hope you find entertaining uh, i will also do a few demos from exercises from our mobile course uh, so that you get a bit of a taste of that as well and yeah, and I hope you find it interesting. We will play uh, this game, right? So uh, in some slides, I will have something uh, about, well, can you spot the vulnerability? Now, since I gave this before, now uh, it wouldn't be fair to give away uh, t-shirts and so on for this, but, uh, you know, uh, but just try to guess it just for fun and, and just to test a little bit your, uh, your skills, right? So let's first uh, start with uh, sexy denial of service attacks. Right, so uh, the context here, it was a mobile application using a tracking library. 
So does anybody know what this uh, command does? Any guesses about this? Let me open the chat. Let's give you maybe 10 more seconds. Does anybody know what this command does here? Nobody? Not sure. Anybody familiar with Netcat? So this is uh, similar to Netcat, right? So maybe you recognize, yes, you recognize some uh, parameters here. So basically what this is doing is uh, this um, listening on port 80 and then whatever. Uh, so SBD is a Netcat clone, right? So it's very similar to Netcat, but you can specify encryption as well. And you can specify things like uh, if uh, for any reason the server stops, then start again uh, after zero seconds, right? So this is the internal to listen again. So for example, if the connection, because on Netcat, right? So somebody connects to you and then they stop the connection and, and then the Netcat listener will no longer uh, be listening again, right? It will not uh, be accepting connections anymore. So with this, it will, be constantly uh, listening, right? So whenever the connection stops, then the server will start again. And then it will execute. So the dash E is uh, similar in Netcat as well. It will execute the yes command, which is basically a command in Linux that just says yes, 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 yes all the time. So basically it's going to send a bunch of information, like a lot of uh, bytes of data to whatever connects to port 80. So using DNS spoofing, we can say, yeah, this server that you um, want to connect to is really uh, this server where I'm doing this, right? So when the application connects to this, connects to port 80, and then the yes command is launched. So we can, with this, we could um, we could crash the application by making use uh, too much memory, right? So you can see here terminating app due to uncaught exception and a malloc exception, right? So malloc is for memory allocation. Uh, attempt to allocate uh, whatever uh, bytes of um, data failed, right? So basically it cannot it cannot allocate more memory because it's like running out of the of space on the device or whatever, or or the allocated uh, you know memory space for a kind of a process in, in iOS. And then this made the application uh, crash, right? So this would be the normal application usage. So you can see it only was using like about 50 megabytes, megabytes of memory. Then you have here like the CPU and so on. And this is uh, at the moment of the crash, you can see it's almost one gigabyte of data. And then this is the this is the crash here, uh, pthread kill. So basically, uh, yeah, it, it resulted in a denial of service. Okay, so. I'm also going to talk about how to fix these things, so it's not just going to be uh, hacking. So if we have some developers, you can maybe also uh, get some ideas about uh, mitigation, right? So how to fix this? Uh, try to use another library, right? In this case, the problem was not in the application itself. It was on a library that the application was using. So to fix this, you would need to replace the library. Uh, another thing would be to implement uh, adequate exception handling, right? So you need a general exception handler for unexpected errors. Now, I know uh, some developers, especially on the Python world, are very heavy on you should know uh, the exception that you are tracking uh, and all this and all that is fine. But on top of all, whatever you do, you need a general exception handler that will catch the everything else you forgot to think about because you will always forget something to, to think about, right? Otherwise, there would be no pen testers, no security bugs and, and all that because everybody would figure out things from scratch, right? So you need always a general exception handler that will catch the unknown. And in those cases, uh, then you would be able to handle uh, a lot of um, exceptions much more gracefully than this, than just an application crash, right? So this will allow you to handle exceptions uh, gracefully, right? So as opposed to a crash, you would have show a, an error message to the user or something like this and then get the full stack trace to the developers for debugging, for example. So now for, to understand the next, um, to understand the next things that we're going to see, um, 
we need to explain a little bit about the SD card on Android, right? So the SD card is kind of the wild west of Android, right? Because this is a location where many applications can read and write. So if you write any secrets to the SD card, then any other application on the phone with SD card privileges can also uh, read that data, right? So this is not a good place to store secrets. It is also not a good place to read data with which you are going to do something dangerous afterwards. So we are going to see examples of uh, all this from the real world. So all this uh, workshop is full of um, issues found in real pen test. Uh, and then it can be extracted without even unlocking the phone in many cases, right? So this is going to depend on the phone model. Sometimes uh, this is not the case. So um, maybe Pixel devices don't have uh, an extractable uh, SD card, but many other Android devices do. So in those cases, you can, you don't even need to know the unlock pattern of the phone. You basically extract the SD card. So a thief, for example, steals your phone and then they can extract the SD card and they can plug it into a computer and they can read all the data. They can see all your pictures, all your, uh, you know, whatever applications uh, saved on the, on the SD card, they can read all that. And usually everything that is written to the SD card is written without encryption. So with all these things together, we have two main threat actors, right? So we have the malicious application um, scenario where malicious applications can read and write everything on the SD card. Uh, and then we have the scenario of a physical attacker. So a thief, or for example, you, you know, walk into a kind of an oppressive regime slash dodgy country, then maybe police can take the, the phone and, and do stuff with it, right? And extract the SD card and then check what, what you have in there. So those would be uh, the main scenarios that we are referring to in the next uh, few examples that we're going to cover. So let's see now one example about saving sensitive stuff uh, on the SD card. So this was an application that was uh, trying to help people in, in a country with an oppressive kind of uh, regime. So this is a, you know, typical countries with a dictatorship uh, and then they are trying to provide um, a, an application that is free to the population so that they can report human rights violations. Uh, and then these human rights violations are uploaded into a server so that the population can see what's going on regardless of what the government does, right? So in principle, a nice idea, but in practice, the implementation was a little bit terrible because they pushed these human rights violation reports to the SD card. So now we have a scenario where this data can be, you know, like if uh, you're using this application and being a nice guy and reporting all the human rights violations that you see, then uh, maybe police stops you and then they extract the SD card, plug it into a computer and they see all these human rights violations that you are reporting and then maybe you go to prison, right? So uh, in an application like this, it would be very important to be have some sort of plausible deniability that, you know, it's not clear that you're using the application. Whatever uh, you report it is is not seen anywhere, uh, and all this would be very important in an application like this uh, for the physical integrity of the people using the the application, right? So quite serious uh, stuff. So in these cases, um, in this case, there was <clears throat> the application was saving the files as XML, but if it was a SQLite database or a text file, whatever all those would be bad as well, right? Anything sensitive you save to the SD card in general, bad idea, right? So in here we can see the fields of the human right violation, device ID, CMIMA, uh, phone number, event title, and then here we have first name, last name, age, gender, marital status, address, affiliation, is victim, number of dependents, and a bunch of other fields, right? So this uh, whistleblower application, uh, the idea of what it was trying to do was very nice, but this uh, implementation flow was uh, really bad. So thankfully, I think we catched it. We, we caught it uh, a bit early and hopefully nobody got uh, injured for this vulnerability, but it was a good thing that we tested and reported this. So this was a scenario about saving sensitive information in the SD card and how that could lead to problems. Now we're going to look at a different scenario where the application loads uh, text files from the SD card, right? So does anybody see what the vulnerability is here? Let me open the chat. Any guesses about what's wrong with that? 
This is the code. So this is an application loads um, files from the SD card. Um, the text file content is emb embedded into HTML later. And this is the code that does the loading of the text file and then embeds it into the HTML. Any guesses about what could be wrong with that? XSS by page data, very good. So correct. So you are right. Yes, so the issue is the application is reading a text file from the SD card, right? So the problem is because of what I explained before, if you have a malicious application on the phone, then uh, that application could write into uh, this text file on the SD card. And then when this other app is loading this, uh, then this is going to result in uh, in XSS, in, in permanent uh, XSS on the application as this concatenation happens, right? So the text file is loaded, then this is uh, this text is converted and added to a variable called page data, and then this page data variable is concatenated into the HTML here. So here uh, is what uh, the actual place where uh, the XSS happens, right? So so yeah, this is. Uh, this is the scenario, and also uh, in this case, this is not just uh, XSS. This is also uh, data exfiltration, right? So we will have a few exercises about data exfiltration in Android and iOS today for your entertainment. But another thing I wanted to say is uh, you have here uh, two possible attack vectors. One I already mentioned: a malicious application installed on the phone writes to the chapter.txt file and then gets permanent XSS. Um, and another scenario could be uh, somebody gets access to the phone, even temporarily, uh, extracts the SD card, plugs it into a computer, puts the XSS in this text file, and then puts the SD card back into the phone, right? So whenever the user goes back to the phone, maybe, you know, they don't know, they don't know this happened, that somebody tampered with the phone, and even if they did, they probably would not guess this. Um, and then when the user uh, goes back into the app, then they will get XSS, right? So that would be the other scenario with a physical attacker uh, extracting the SD card, right? So another thing to bear in mind. So in this case, uh, because the application had, uh, it was very poorly written and it was concatenating this and so on, there were problems with the single quotes, the double quotes and so on. So uh, to avoid those kind of problems, there's a very cool uh, website called hackvector.co.uk by Gareth Hayes, a uh, buddy of mine. He also works for uh, Portswigger, the company behind Burp. So in Burp, there's also an extension uh, by the same name, Hackvector. So you can uh, install this Hackvector um, extension in Burp and then do uh, all the same things that you can do on the website from Burp, if you prefer that. But the cool thing is, uh, if you do it from our website, you don't even have to have anything installed. You can just use the website. So uh, depending on, you know, where you are and the setup you have, this can be very handy sometimes that only using a browser, you can do all this stuff. So in this case, we have the payload here. So we are trying to make a request to a local file and then uh, alert this file to to see, right? So this is uh, doing an XML HTTP request. It sends the request and then gets the response and then uh, alerts the response proving file access if the file can be read. And then what we are doing is we are uh, modifying this payload. So it's all converted or encoded into a string from charcoal, right? So this is the evolve from charcoal is one of the things that you can do with hack vector among many other possibilities. So in here, you can see that these uh, results in eval uh, string from charcoal and then here you have all the different uh, character codes and then uh, basically this avoids all the single the double quotes uh, and other uh, special characters uh, you can avoid this way and then this made the payload work smoothly right so just a quick tip for the pen testers among you uh, this sometimes can be helpful so this is the result, right? So we could read the local file, which means we are able to steal local files and send them to an attacker, right? So how to fix this? The first thing would be to avoid saving uh, sensitive information to the SD card and then avoid loading HTML from unsafe locations, right? So you should not load uh, HTML, for example, from the SD card or text that is then concatenated into HTML, as in this case. Another thing would be to output encode input before concatenate it into uh, HTML. 
and then disable JavaScript, right, if possible. So you can do web view, get settings, and then set JavaScript enabled to false. So this will disable JavaScript. And then if you really must use the SDK, right, there's going to be cases where you really must because of space or whatever restrictions. So in those cases, what you can do is uh, you can hash the, the cached files, right? So if this is like a cache to save space in, in the internal storage of the phone or something, you can hash the files and then save these hashes in protect, protected storage. So then you can first check the hash before you open the file and then if the uh, file the hash matches then you can load the file right so that would be one thing and then another thing would be to use encryption right so you could have the decryption key in protected storage so the android uh, key store would be the best place for that uh, in the case of android uh, and then uh, even though um, the file is in insecure storage at least it's encrypted and the decryption key is uh, in another location, right? So if you put the decryption key on the SD card, then you defeat everything. So you need the decryption key somewhere else uh, on the Android um, key store, for example. Uh, and then uh, you are able to decrypt these files while the encryption also protects you from, uh, you know, tampering uh, and so on, right? So you could check, you, will, you could do both, like have some hash to verify the file has not been tampered and then uh, some encryption. So, uh, you know, like malicious attackers, whether physical or a malicious application cannot read the contents in there and cannot tamper uh, with the contents, right? So you could do those things as well. So now let's talk about copy and paste, right? So we have, in this scenario, this was a password vault application. So similar to uh, LastPass or KeePass, an application like this, right? So basically it lets users uh, add, um, you know, credentials for websites uh, and so on inside, right? So something like BitGarden, for example. Uh, then, uh, then, yeah, that's, uh, anybody know what this attack could be, right? So just take a look at this and try to figure out what this attack is. Traversal plus pace jacking. Very good. I see there's uh, quite a good level in the audience today. Very good. Um, so yes, so basically what we are doing here is we are showing, well, maybe this is a little bit easier to read here. We are using the CSS trickery so that we show some text to the user, but then this text will not be selectable, right? So you can do this web key, the user select none. So the user sees unselectable text. And then when the user copies the text, they're really copying something else, right? So you can do that with uh, CSS. So you do WebKit user select none. So this uh, made this text uh, unselectable, even though it was uh, displayed. And then this text using the Z index and opacity trickery, what we're doing is it's basically hidden. So the user cannot see this text, uh, but this is the text that will be copied. When, when you try to copy this, you are going to copy this attack, right? And here we have the path traversal part. Right, so what we are doing is we are traversing out of the SD card where the file was being intended to be saved, and then we walk into the internal storage of the keychain um, application. Um, and then uh, we are going to override the open keychain DB, which is the SQLite database where all the password entries uh, were, right? So in essence, you have a malicious website, for example, a fake uh, guide or something, and then you need to get the user to copy and paste this text, right? So they try to copy this, and then when they paste it, they paste this, right? And then this is another thing with mobile devices that because the screen is so small, you don't really see here the dot dot slash anywhere. You don't see a lot of the payload uh, just because uh, in mobile devices, developers like to make things pretty. So you don't see the full um, the full path that has been pasted here. You only see the end. And uh, this can be useful uh, in some attacks so that you can hide part of, parts of the payload, right? So uh, the user essentially sees text A, but really pastes uh, text B, uh, which is ideal for fake tutorials. So we have some fake website, and then the user copies this. And then there was an export log functionality. So this is going to write a file. It's going to export a log file. But here we're pasting the with the directory traversal. 
we are pasting this and then what this is going to do is going to save the log file in the exact same location where the uh, password entries are saved so this is going to destroy all the password entries so what happened is the user copies this then pastes in there and then they click ok so you see log exported successfully and then right after this the application would crash because of course the database has been uh, erased completely so you have now instead of a database you have a log file and then when you open the application again you see that you don't have any keys yet right so this is kind of uh, wiping the entire uh, password vault uh, of the application right so the user overrides the vault database the entire contents are no longer accessible and the application crashes right so in this case this is a public report so you can read the full details here but that is uh, you know that is the context here it was a uh, uh, a cool attack and it's it goes to show you like how you can combine the, the you know like the small ui with copy and paste trickery uh, and so on issues on the user interface that normally maybe you do not consider issues but with some uh, copy and paste trickery like this you could still argue that there's potential for exploitability a little bit smaller because you need some user interaction and a little bit of social engineering but still uh, a valid issue right uh, so how to uh, mitigate this um, you should have uh, you should make sure that users have an option to see the entire uh, pasted text and not just the beginning or, or the end right so this would be good so even if you truncated you should have like at least a, a button that users can click and see see full url or something like that ideally right so and yeah this is what i mentioned is a common problem in mobile applications you have small user interface uh, data rendering truncation so excellent spoofing right uh, if you just expect a file from the user then get the base name uh, the file name uh, of the path and just ignore the rest so that will be another uh, useful mitigation so you would not in this case you would not allow like dot dot slash and things like this and if you really expect a full path then you can do things like this, right? So you can reject paths that contain dot dot. Uh, you can also uh, resolve the path, right? So first uh, resolve the path to the final path that is going to be. So if there's any dot dot slash, uh, whatever, then you will end up with the actually actual final path. And then once you do this, you can verify that the path, the final resolve path, uh, starts with the expected location. So in this case, the application tried to save a file on the SD card. So you should, uh, you know, make sure that the, the path starts like that. Then you should concatenate the extension to the final URL. So if you expect uh, dot .log, then you should add uh, dot .log at the end. So this ensures that even if some vulnerability exists, at least uh, the attacker does not control the extension. So in this case, this alone would have prevented the override of the .db extension because we would be appending the dot .log. So this is also good practice to make sure you append uh, whatever extension uh, you want to, to just enforce it, right? Let's talk about uh, spoofing attacks. So in this case, we want to uh, show the, U the user one URL, but then when they click on it, they will really go somewhere else, right? So uh, you can achieve this sometimes with uh, Unicode uh, right to left and left to right characters. So you can send a link like uh, with these special characters here and then mog.evil.org and then the victim really sees grow.life.com but then when they click on this they really go to mog.evil.org right so this sometimes works against email applications uh, chat applications and things like this is going to require a, a user click but the thing is you can uh, fool the user into you know believing they are really clicking on something else right and this is a, a nice write-up about this kind of attack being used uh, in the in the wild, right? So you can see this on email attacks. So now let's talk about content uh, providers, right? So this is a browser application with a custom URL handler, right? So something like Safari, Chrome, Firefox, uh, something like this uh, in a mobile application. Uh, and then we were able to take news by uh, to this content provider right so the content provider normally you will find on the android manifest and here uh, this was a news application so uh, by knowing the url of the content provider we have like content and then some vulnerable app uh, best articles and then start and then this is like parsing the url and here we can add like some title and content and stuff for uh, the fake news and then we can insert this uh, fake news uh, article into uh, the content provider, right? So this was uh, 
a content provider that was exposed to any other application on the phone. So any other application on the phone would be able to insert uh, fake news articles, right? So, um, you know, you could do this for pranking purposes, but it's kind of uh, an issue as well. So how to fix this? Do not export content providers uh, unless needed. And then if you must export content providers, then protect the content provider with a permission that requires uh, a signature, right? So if you do this, then only applications uh, signed by the same developer can call the provider. Now, there will be cases where you actually need the content provider to be exposed to all other applications uh, on the phone. Uh, for example, by, you know, if you uh, want to send a file to another application, things like this uh, need to be a little bit more wide open. But in those cases, you can like implement some validation to ensure whatever you are sharing or whatever the content provider is doing, if it's sharing files, if it's sharing uh, results from a SQLite database or whatever else it's doing, that uh, this content provider, you know, that's like the adequate validation to ensure uh, the functionality cannot be uh, abused, right? So, uh, so that would be another uh, possible mitigation depending on um, what the application does. So now let's talk about uh, local server attacks. So when you think in mobile applications, almost nobody would ever think about having a local server uh, on the phone, right? But sometimes applications can, you know, run binaries. They uh, they will run a local server, especially VPN apps, for example. Will uh, normally have or some application that is using Tor is going to have like some Tor binary that is going to run Tor uh, on the phone, and then it will uh, tunnel through that. It will see what's the listening port, and it will tunnel through that, and so on. So uh, in some cases, there can be uh, local servers uh, set up by a mobile app, and in those cases, you have to worry about a lot of things, right? Because if you have a local server, then what interface is the server listening on? Can uh, you know somebody on the same local network uh, access this um, access this server? Uh, can you know is there like authentication or authorization uh, implemented in this local server? So you have to worry about a lot of things. Um, so in this case, we have a Cordova uh, iOS application, and this was using a plugin that was running a, a local server. Right, so a Cordova uh, application on iOS. So Cordova, if you are not familiar, is a, a, a mobile framework that allows you to write applications in JavaScript. So the entire uh, application is written uh, using JavaScript. Um, and then this is cool because you write the application once in JavaScript and then it works on Android and iOS, um, as opposed to you know having to pay Android and iOS developers. So you can maybe you know pay only JavaScript developers and get it working on both. Of course, it's not as easy as that. There's always going to be some edge cases, but in general, it just makes it a little bit easier, right? So you can reuse a lot more code for both platforms and so on. So this application was using a plugin that was running a local server, and we can see here uh, what we could do, right? So this uh, this server was vulnerable to path traversal attacks, so we could have uh, knowing the the port on the on local host, which was hard coded in the app, so this was. Uh, Guessable, right? Anybody reversing the app would know this. And then you could do like dot dot slash. So this is like a URL encoding for slash. So by doing this, you could like see the Etsy password file on the phone. You could, uh, you know, check the files outside of the directory that the server was running on uh, and so on. So uh, we could, for example, uh, test this with Safari. In Safari, we could see like the contents of the password with this local server, the contents uh, of the directory, and then we could also uh, weaponize this by, uh, you know, dumping all the files. So we can see here, this is uh, looping through all the relative paths, relative paths of the application that we know, and then just doing wget of this and trying to dump all the files. Uh, so this was the output of the script, basically showing uh, all the files that were being so this is basically a shell one liner. It's just uh, looping through the files. It does a wget for each file uh, on uh, checking on local host, right, on the port where the server was listening, and then it's just saving the output so that we can then check later, uh, you know, the the URL. So in here in the output we can see all the URLs that were being retrieved. 
So how to fix this, right? So do not implement local servers unless truly really needed, right? So this is uh, a lot of attack surface, right? Because you need authentication, authorization, uh, can other uh, applications on the phone call these? Uh, you have to worry about a lot of things, right? So if possible, don't do it. Now, if you need it, then at least require authentication so malicious applications can call it, right? You should, you should require, you should have something like maybe, um, you know, um, basic authentication or similar so that, you know, like only the, the intended application can access the server and not any other application on the phone or even worse, anybody on the network where the phone is, right? If, if you're listening on um, 000 as opposed to uh, 127.0.0.1. So if you are not listening on localhost, if you're listening on the IP of the phone, then somebody on the same network where the phone is could also uh, call the local web server and things would get a bit worse, right? And then another thing would be to validate URLs with appropriate uh, access control uh, and path traversal mitigation, right? So lots of things to worry about if you run your own uh, local server. So with this out of the way, uh, what do you think? Does cross-site request forgery exist in mobile applications? Any guesses about that? Cross I request forgery on mobile applications. Is it possible? Yes, no? Any guesses? What do you think? We have a yes. Anybody else? Yes, with exclamation. Okay, so we seem to have consensus. Everybody thinks yes. And you are correct. So, yes, the request forgery is possible, and we will explain now how and do a quick uh, a few demos about this, right? So, um, now we're going to look at deep link attacks achieving uh, user impersonation and deep link attacks to bypass uh, authorization controls, right? So, this is uh, one of the uh, one of the exercises, small exercises we have uh, in the course. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit first what deep links are. So uh, to understand deep links, right? So these are basically URIs that can be used to navigate different parts of an application. They can be available uh, on both Android and iOS. Deep links can have, but do not have to have uh, custom schemes, right? So you can have, uh, for example, a social media application can register a URL like social app and then colon slash last homepage. So you could have a custom URL like this, but you could also have HTTPS, then some domain, whatever, and have that being registered as a, as a deep link, right? So a deep link does not necessarily have to be like this. It can also be, you know, like HTTPS and some website. It can also be like that, as long as the application registers that URL to be opened uh, inside of the app. Uh, so any click to such a link will automatically be directed to this application. And then this starts to get interesting when there's like uh, different parameters that you can pass either through the URL itself or, uh, or parameters, right? So during this workshop, we are going to see quite a few examples uh, about this, right? So uh, we can have the ability to navigate to different activities and pages. So for example, we can have a social app and then profile social app profile profile picture and this uh, so this is going to show us the profile this is going to show us the picture of the profile uh, and so on right so we can have things like this and this makes uh, things a little bit uh, nice to to access right so you can see why uh, developers like to do this because it's just nice right so we have a quick url you go to where you want so when we are talking uh, about deep link on android we will see we will see this on ios uh, later on you want to look at the Android manifest, right? And in here, uh, activities can be explicitly exported or implicitly exported. So explicitly exported would be that you will have here activity and here you will have export true. So this would tell you that the application is exported. Now, in this case, we don't have here exported true, but this doesn't really matter because we have an intent filter. So an intent filter is another way of exporting the activity. Even if you had here exported false, if you have an intent filter, this takes priority over whatever exported uh, says here. Right? So if you have intent filter, this will over, always override whatever you have uh, on export. This will make the application exportable, right? So 
and this means that other applications on the phone can call this. And then this is going to define on Android uh, what the expected uh, URL format is, right? So in this case, we have Android scheme as a map, a host get creds, and then path prefix user. So this is going to be a URL like this, a map get creds user. So this is telling you the structure of uh, the URLs that the application is expecting. So with this alone, uh, this means that any application on the phone can call this deep link, right? So if there's no validation or depending what the deep link does, it can result into problems. Uh, and then separately to all these, we have this browsable uh, attribute that is possible uh, to add to, to a deep link activity. So when this is done, this means that the deep link activity can also be exploited from or attacked from a, from a browser, right? So browsable browser, so there's a quick way to remember it. So if it's browsable, this means that the deep link can also be uh, attacked from, from a browser, right? So from a malicious web page. So this also makes things interesting. And we're going to see uh, a lot of examples uh, today about this. So it would make uh, a lot more sense. Um, we also have a nice uh, SQL, uh, SQL injection with code execution towards the end of the workshop today, uh, exploiting both uh, using the browsable uh, technique as well as uh, using the local application uh, technique, right? So we will use uh, both. So uh, as I said, we give you all access to the training portal. So uh, if you have any access problems, just email admin at 7 securitycom and, and we will troubleshoot that. But basically this would be the first exercise, right? So I'm going to explain it first and then I'll do a demo. And then I'll give you like five minutes to try it out uh, a little bit by yourself, but you can feel free to start playing with this, right? So uh, first uh, log into the training portal and then you download the app from here. So uh, when you log into the training portal, go to the workshop. Uh, so just click on the workshop and then click on the download uh, slides. And then from the slides, while you are still logged into the training portal, just click on this link and this will download the app, right? So that's how that's how things work. So uh yeah so just click on this from the slides and then you will download the, the this particular version of periscope because you need this particular version right so if you use any other uh, version it won't work because this vulnerability uh, was fixed later so we have a couple of uh, interesting case studies in the course so periscope uh, is has a nice cross request forgery vulnerability using deep links that we will see uh, in the course itself i think we also have uh, another one a fingerprint bypass with um, for Shopify, the Shopify application and this other uh, interesting uh, case studies as well, of course. But uh, today we are going to see the Periscope one. So just download this and you can like start playing with it while I'm talking. Uh, and yeah, just get this version, not the latest version, because of course uh, this was patched. So the first thing we need to do is uh, open the Periscope application and we need to create an account, right? If you don't create an account, in, in the attack uh, won't work because First, you need to, you know, you need to have a user, right? So there's different ways where you can do this. You can use like a Google account, Facebook, Twitter, phone number. That's up to you. Just use any of the methods will work just fine, but you need uh, to create an account first in Periscope. And then uh, we're going to go methodology-wise how you normally go about this, right? So the first thing would be to decompile the APK. And then uh, this is going to basically allow us to look at the Android manifest uh, and then at the source code and so on, right? So this is the output of APK tool, which is a tool that is free. You can Google uh, APK tool and download it. It's free, it's nice, it typically works uh, great. And uh, this is going to allow us to look at the Android manifest, right? So this is what you see when you decompile the app, right? So you do APK tool D and then the, the APK, so that's enough and that will extract the APK in a local uh, folder. And then after that, you will be able to look uh, at the Android manifest. So in this case, we can see here that the Android manifest has a lot of activities with intent filters, right? As I said before, intent filter means that the activity is exposed to any other um, application uh, on the phone. But in this case, we can also see there's a number of activities that are browsable. So these activities can also be attacked from a browser. And in this case, you can see that the Android host, uh, the, the Android scheme is HTTPS and the Android host is Periscope.tv. 
So this is an example of what I said before, that a deep link does not necessarily have to have a custom scheme. It can also be HTTP or HTTPS. And as long as the application registers it, then, um, you know, when you click on a link like that, it will be opened in the app as opposed to uh, the browser, right? Or, or maybe Android will show you, like, how do you want to open this? And it will show you the application as well as the browser, and then the user chooses, right? It's going to depend a little bit, but uh, in general, it will work this way. And also, normally, when you choose the application, you can set as default, and then it won't ask you uh, anymore, right? So you can say always open Periscope URLs in Periscope, and then from there onwards, uh, the, the links will always be open in Periscope, right? This is going to depend a little bit on the phone and the setup, but that's the way it works, right? So just to mention, uh, deep links uh, can be HTTP and HTTPS, as well as custom URLs, right? And then here, we can see a lot of information about the structure, right? So we have Android host user, Android scheme, uh, PSCP. So PSCP colon slash slash uh, user is going to do something. Right, so with this, we can start like gathering information about how the deep links are going to look like. So in this case, we will focus on these ones, right? PSCP, colon slash slash user, right? So we know this from the scheme and we know the user from the host. Uh, and then um, the rest, uh, you can either figure it out from the Android manifest or you would have to look at the source code of the application, try to see uh, the code in the activities, reverse it and figure it out from there, right? So uh, with this, uh, this means there could be a parameter passed to this deep link, which could be the Periscope user ID, and then the user ID is a unique identifier for any given user profile, right? So, uh, in this case, we will focus on uh, this user, so PSCP, colon, slash, slash, user, and then MKBHD, so this is basically the profile of the user we will be doing we will be using for this demo. And there's uh, several ways in which we can test this, right? We can use this, uh, you can test this with a, an application on the phone. So this one, if you click from the slides, you can get it from the training portal as well. It's called Deep Link Tester. And then in here, this is basically an application. You can put there uh, the Deep Link and then you click on go to URI and then it will open the profile uh, in Periscope for this user, right? So that's one way. Another way could be using ADB command. So you can do ADB shell and then start, and then you start the activity, and then you do PSCP user uh, and MBK uh, BHD. So this is going to open the profile using ADB. And another possibility would be to use Drowser, right? So with Drowser, we can do run scanner activity browsable, and this will scan for activities for only browsable activities. Now, this is going to be a little bit limited, the output, but that is a good starting point. It will give you some uh, URLs, right? So, uh, like, if you uh, look at the Android manifest hard, you're going to find more uh, URLs like this, especially on Periscope. But it still gives you, like, some uh, starting point, right? It gives you some invocable URLs. It brings you to some uh, classes that are exported. So, here you can see the activities um, that are exposed and that are browsable. Right, so Drowser helps you a little bit uh, by searching this type of activities, right? But remember, browsable means the deep link can be acts open from a browser, uh, but you could have deep links that are in activities that are not browsable, and in those cases, the activity would still be uh, callable from a malicious application on the phone, but not from a browser, right? So that's the difference. And then uh, we can just call the activity. So we can do run activity start uh, of data URI and then user and the profile. So that would be another way. And then because the activity is browsable, we can also do it from a malicious website, right? So if you open this link uh, on uh, your Android phone, you can click on open user and this will open the profile. And then if you uh, click on the Periscope Crosshair Request Forgery demo, then it will do the actual Crosshair Request Forgery, right? So with this, we are only opening the profile for now. And now we will move on to the Crosshair Request Forgery itself, right? So in this case, we can see we are not following uh, this user because uh, we have the follow option instead of unfollow. Um, so now to follow, we need to append this follow. Now, a uh, common question I get uh, in this workshop is how do you figure out the follow? You will need to look at the source code, right? So you need to figure out this from the source code. It's, it's going to take a little bit of uh, analysis, figuring out, uh, you know, you reverse the application, you look at the Java files or, the, you know, whatever the application is written in, 
if you try to look at the source code and try to figure this out. The the beginning of the dibbling uh, it, it will be given pretty much by the Android manifest, but then the rest uh, you have to you know do a little bit of trial and error. Maybe you can find some uh, URIs online if the application is very popular. So that could also be a good starting point. And then by looking at the source code is how you uh, try to find uh, vulnerabilities like this. So now to exploit the cross-site request forgery vulnerability, we can use the four methods as well, right? So with Dibbling Tester, uh, you will need to unfollow uh, the profile first to verify, but you basically add follow, then go to URI, and then we are following this user without any other user interaction other than clicking on something on another application. So this is bad. This is the cross-site request uh, forgery using Dibbling Tester. With ADP, same thing, we just, we just do the same ADB command and then at the end add follow and this will follow the user. Then using Drowser, uh, we will need to unfollow first to verify as always, uh, but basically it's the same uh, activity and then follow. So uh, that is how this is going to work. And then uh, from the browser, because the activity is browsable, just uh, open this link on the phone, and then when you click on page code cross request for the demo, it will follow this user, right? So you unfollow, click somewhere, and then click on page code cross request for the demo, and you will see we're following the user uh, again. So yeah, this is how uh, the proof of concept looks like. So we have the open user is basically using the URL to open the profile, and then the follow uh, for the page code cross request for the demo just is the same thing, but then at the end we have follow right so this is how the html looks like you could host this yourself or you can use the link uh, provided in the slides it both options will work just fine but this is how uh, the attack works right so this is all hosted here so you can just open this on the phone and then i'll show you now uh, a demo now in a moment so fixing issues derived from URL schemes and deep links is usually accomplished by prompting the user for confirmation prior to performing the action. So in this case, you should show a message like, are you sure you would like to follow uh, user X? And then only if the user confirms this, you would perform the action, right? So the issue here is that Periscope was not uh, confirming the following uh, request to the user. So you could have an application that follows uh, random people, and then you can increase the number of followers uh, using this vulnerability, for example, in Periscope, right? So this was the problem. Uh, so this is a nice example of a cross site request forgery uh, in the field uh, using Periscope. With this, let me do uh, a quick demo. Let me first check if I'm sharing my entire screen. Yes, good. So, okay, so we have here, uh, or uh, an emotion. Um, so I have a Jenny motion, but for this, you can use a, a normal phone. You don't even need a rooted Android phone. So anything will work here. Uh, an Android phone, if it's rooted or not, it doesn't really matter for this exercise. Uh, you need to install Drowser. So I'm just going to open it now. And then this will start the Drowser server. So this is just for uh, Drowser commands that I showed. So first you need to start, start the Drowser application. Um, and then, um, and then I can go here to Periscope, right? So I'm going to open here Periscope, um, and this is the Periscope application, right? So this is one thing we need, uh, and another thing would be now uh, to open um, my VM here. But before this, I need to connect the my VM to. Let's see. I need to connect my VM to uh, to the Denimotion VM, right? So you have to do, if you're using a VM, you have to do ADV devices, right? And then you copy this. And uh, now from here, I should be able to do ADV, well, let me do this connect first, because I think this uh, was slipping this uh, VM. So now I do ADV connect, so you can see that now I'm connected. So now that I'm connected, I can start running commands here. So if I do, for example, um, ADV start, I move my video a little bit down. So if I do um, ADV start and then uh, with the view, and then I'm passing the, the user, so I just, hit, uh, I just hit this. So now if I minimize this, this we don't need anymore. 
here you can see that uh, we have seen the um, we have seen the user, right? So yeah, let me stop around a little bit, maybe here, and then I'll put my face here, something like this. So you can see we are not following him, right? So uh, we will need to follow, right? So this will be the manual step. Now I'm going to unfollow. So I'm not following him now. But now if I go here and I add here follow, so we can see here the crosshair request forgery using ADB, right? So now I'm following, uh, I'm following him even though I didn't really click anything, right? So you can follow arbitrary people. So now I'm going to unfollow again. So I go here. I open the profile. You can see I'm not following. And then if I open the profile with the follow, uh, we can see here that I'm following him, right? So uh, this would be the example uh, with ADB. So now let's do the example with browser, right? So uh, in browser, uh, I will do this uh, scanner as well so that you can see that. So let me exit because we need to connect again. So now uh, I start the browser and then I can run the uh, scanner. Forgot that later. So you do run uh, scanner activity browsable. So this is just scanning for browsable activities on the Periscope application. So this is the idea of the application. And here we can see uh, the discovered uh, invocable URIs as well as the activities that are browsable uh, in this application. Now, this uh, invocable URIs list is by no means comprehensive, but it is a good starting point, right? So uh, that's another thing to bear in mind. Uh, and then if I um, go now, let me see, maybe I have it here. Yeah, so we can now like open the profile. So same thing as before, not following the person. Now, if I add follow, at the end of this, uh, we should see here that I'm following uh, the person now, right? So, uh, really nice uh, way to do this. And then, finally, I'm also going to show you the, um, the method using the browser, right? So, um, this is the browser, so I can open the user. Uh, you can see that when I open the user, we can open it because it's a browsable activity. So you can see here I'm not following him. And then if I go back to the browser and I click on the demo, we can see here that now I'm following the person. So this is an attack that you could implement from a malicious website that uh, users visit, right? So now I'm going to unfollow. Um, Okay, and then what else uh, do I want to show you? Yeah, another thing would be um, you would go to the Android manifest, right? So the typical way to go about this is you compile the application, then you do something like find the Android manifest in all the decompiled files. So here uh, I'm opening this, and here you could look for a scheme, for example, to look for an Android scheme so I can now uh, use the N on VI to go to the next NAT, right? So we can see there's a lot of Android schemes, HTTP, schemes, HTTPS, PSCP, PSCPD schemes, right? So lots of possible combinations here uh, to try to attack and find a, a vulnerability. And then these are the intent filters, right? So you would see, okay, this has some interesting, uh, you know, uh, intent filter here with a lot of schemes and stuff. So this is a deep link uh, activity. And now I want to find what the activity is, right? So you would scroll up and see the activity that has all these intent filters. So in this case, it would be uh, the app router activity. So you can copy this name of the activity and then you could, um, you could do something like this, right? So you can do find uh, name launch activity or the activity that you found. So I can paste here a router activity .java, right? So then that points me to the decompile source for this. So I can open this in VI, for example. So I can VI this, and then we can see that, okay, this actually is extending the launch activity here. We don't have almost any code, so we have to find launch activity .java. So I can do that here. 
is going how we are going to be the name of the activity and that java at the end so you can do launch activity at java and then here it's just a matter of going through the ugly decompiled code and figuring out well how does this uh, logic look like normally you would look for get intent so this is going to take you to the place where the intent is received and then from here you will have to decipher from this how to you know see if uh if there's any follow or something at the end right so that's is uh you know it's going to take a little bit longer to figure that out but always pay attention to um the classes that things extend so in this example launch activity extends d so you have to look at d.java in the decompile code and see maybe the code uh, doing this follow is there uh, and so on right so you have to do a little bit of uh, you know reversing and uh, trial and error to figure out where things are but that is how you would go about finding this uh, slash follow so with this uh, let's leave uh, five minutes uh, this exercise and then we will continue uh, with the rest of the presentation sounds okay any questions so far let me put here five minutes so i set a timer for five minutes let me check in the chat. no questions in the chat Okay, then I'll stop the recording and then we can continue in five minutes. Any questions before we move on? Any questions about this? Was it interesting? Anybody can hear me? Seems to be... Okay, good. Cool, so let's continue then. No questions? Okay, then let's move on. Oh, let me see, there's something out. Rock on. <laughs> okay. Cool. Then let's continue. Now let's going to now, now we're going to see uh, Dublink attacks to make uh, phone calls, right? So this is an abbreviated version of finding and exploiting URL handlers, which is a section uh, of the iOS uh, part of the course. So um, yeah, I hope you find it interesting as well. So for this, um, from the right, just click on this link, and then you will get the right version of the Dumb Vulnerable Insecure App version two, which is the the application, the vulnerable application that we will use for this exercise. You can also read more about it from the official website. You can also download it from there. I, I don't know like if they changed anything since we uploaded this, so better to use the one in the portal because it's the, you know, is the one we know works. <laughs> and then if things with open source, if things change afterwards, we don't really know, right? So this is the correct version to use. Um, and then when you're looking for um, vulnerabilities uh, on, on iOS, um, the file that you need to look at is the info pillis, right? So this is similar to uh, the Android manifest.xml on Android, but for iOS, right? So this is uh, a little bit different. Um, I mean, it's for iOS, so it's going to be different, right? Uh, and there's uh, a few ways to look at it, right? The main issue with info plist for, with plist files in general is that this is a proprietary format by Apple. So uh, iOS and uh, macOS devices can open this file format natively, but in other operating systems, it's a little bit messy, right? So you can use some command line utilities like plutil to deal with, to use uh, plist files on Linux, for example, or on the shell uh, in an iOS device, uh, as well as um, another thing that uh, you can do is um, to use a, a tool from the phone. I'll, I'll show you a demo of this um, on the iOS demo after this one. So basically, on the info pill is you're looking for uh, URL schemes, right? So there's uh, going to be a section called CF bundle URL schemes, and this would be the custom URL schemes uh, on iOS uh, to try to attack uh, deep links, right? So in this case, we have two custom uh, URL schemes, so Dumb Vulnerable and Secure App and Dumb Vulnerable and Secure Swift. So these are the two uh, URL handlers that we have in this uh, application. 
right? So you could go like navigate um, to the place where you um, extracted the application, and then you can grab the info plist file and and see this, right? Uh, this grab might not always work depending on the, if the info plist file is, uh, you know, readable using uh, normal text or if you have to convert it first. So there's another way if you have a Mac or you have you have a Hackintosh, right? So you don't really need to have a Mac to run Xcode, right? So you can Google, uh, you know, run a Mac uh, from Linux or run a Mac from um, Windows. And you will see some like hacking guides that help you do this. Um, of course, do all that at your own risk, legal, legal, legal wise. I'm not really sure uh, how legal or illegal that is. But, uh, you know, just mentioned, you don't really need a Mac to do this. So it's possible to do that, right? And, <clears throat> and then with Xcode, um, if you have the source code of the application, you would click on the project. And then this will open uh, this panel here and you have to find the info tab and then scroll all, all the way down to the bottom and you will see these URL types. And here you will have the URL scheme. So this is another way to find uh, deep links or custom URL handlers uh, in iOS, right? So click on the um, application info tab, URL types, and then URL schemes, right? So this would be a way to do it uh, with Xcode. I'll show you uh, another way with a filter in the demo. And then we need to know, so we need, uh, at this stage we know, okay, this application has two URL handlers, then vulnerable secure Swift, and then vulnerable and secure app, and then colon slash slash. So that's all we know, right? But we don't know what comes after this, you know, what kind of uh, URLs are expected by these applications and so on. So we have to go a little bit deeper. So the place to, to look for this in, in iOS is called the app delegate. So this is a file that Android, uh, that iOS applications uh, typically always have. So most applications uh, for iOS are written in, in Swift or in Objective-C. So this is going to be in an app delegate file. If it is Objective-C, it's going to be .m. And if it's Swift, it will be app delegate .swift, right? So most modern uh, iOS applications are now written in Swift. So this is kind of the new way of doing things. So most likely, uh, if it is a relatively uh, modern application you are checking, it would be appdelegate.swift, right? So if you don't have Xcode, you can do find dot and then dash name appdelegate.swift, and this will point you to where the app delegate is. So you would see some output like this. And then inside of here, you can see, okay, this is the file, the appdelegate.swift, and this is the code, right? So you have function application, open URL, and then it, this takes the, the URL parameter here, and it is splitting the URL by this string, phone call number, right? So this is uh, taking this, this string, and then uh, it's going to return an array. So array starts with zero. So we will have the zero part will be the URL handler. So the damn vulnerable insecure app, for example, colon slash slash would be the string uh, after this. And then uh, the string after that will be on the next uh, position on the array, which will be one, right? So zero is going to be to the left of a uh, phone call number and one will be to the right, right? So we know this from this uh, split operation, right? So this is URL absolute string component separated by phone call numbers. This is creating as um, an array of the results uh, from splitting the string into uh, chunks based on this string here. So there's going to be a zero string for whatever comes before this and a one uh, parameter for what comes after. So what comes after is going to be the phone number. So this is casting that match uh, to integer and then it's checking that is different than nil. So if this cast to integer is successful, then it considers that this is a valid URL since the argument is a number and then it will make the phone call, right? So this uh, is, is an interesting scenario on mobile devices because you can uh, monetize your deep link attack by making uh, the victim ring um, a premium phone number. So you can like make money out of the cross site request uh, forgery, right? So it's the rest of the, um, of the code. And then if you're using Xcode, so if you notice here, we didn't, um, yeah, no, that's something else I want to explain later. Yeah, forget about that. So now if you're using Xcode, um, 
is you're going to do something similar, right? So you open the project and then go to the vulnerable secure app and then you go to the app delegate.swift, right? So methodology wise, the app delegate.swift is going to be always inside of this directory. And here you're looking for the application function. So this is the one that is going to handle the open URL. And here, uh, again, we have URL absolute string component separated by phone call number. So this is uh, creating the, the array uh, of, so it is splitting the URL into chunks based on this string. So the position zero would be the custom URL handler and position one is whatever comes after this. So this is going to be the phone number and then it will call uh, the phone number here, right? So this would be the way to do the code review um, on uh, Xcode, which is the IDE for uh, iOS and uh, macOS development. Um, and yeah, and this is how you would go about finding the vulnerability. So with this, now we know how the URL should look like, right? So when we looked at the info pillars, we only had this piece of information. After looking at the app delegate, we can see the rest of the URL, so phone call number. And then we can test this with a jailbroken phone or with a non-jailbroken phone, right? So you don't really need a jailbroken phone for this exercise. So as long as you have some iOS device, uh, this will work. And so you go to the URL, to this URL, just open this uh, in Safari, for example. And then you can use the link, the link there. Uh, to test. So this is how the HTML looks like on that page. And we have basically down vulnerable and secure at Swift, and then phone call number, and this is the number. And then this is just displaying uh, the same URL in the text so that we know what we're doing. But in practice, uh, in a real attack, this would say win an, app, an iPad now or something like that that is enticing to a user because you want the click, right? So the click is what is going to trigger the attack. So you would say something like that, you know, I like win an iPad now uh, and so on, something like that. Uh, and yeah, this is how the URLs look like. And then when you click on these, uh, they will open uh, on the application. Right? So you have the uh, Safari uh, browser, and then you click on some of these links, and then this will open um, the application, and we get the, the call to a premium phone number, right? So uh, yeah, this another, this, uh, let's mention this again. So the ability to make an application ring arbitrary phone numbers is a serious issue in the mobile environment due to the possibility of making the application ring premium numbers. Hence, the attackers can monetize the attack vector more easily, right? So um, this is an interesting attack vector. We will also see another example uh, from a pen test uh, about this uh, later on in this uh, workshop. So let's do a demo about this. So I have here my friend iOS. So this is our uh, iOS phone. If I'm sharing this uh, correctly, let me just double check. I think you can see that, right? Yeah. Cool. So, and yeah, so this is uh, the iOS device. So first, methodology-wise, you would go to, well, let's, let me look at the info pillars, right? So I'm going to open Filsa, and here, let me uh, go back here just to make this a little bit more realistic. So you could like tap on, uh, I tapped on the, let me just close this. I'm tapping here first, right? And then we have this message. And we wait the four seconds, and now I'm going to tap on this. So this will show me the list of applications on the phone. And now I'm scrolling down to find uh, down vulnerable and secure app, right? So I'm using Filsa. So for to use this application, you would need a um, jailbroken device, but it's a really good uh, tool that we use during the course as well. So now I tap here on the I for information about this uh, application. And here we can see the two directories that every uh, iOS application has, right? So we have the bundle, which is where all the um, application binaries are, all the like libraries, you know, the files that the application itself uses are going to be here. And then we have a separate directory for all the data files. So this would be like places for the cookies, uh, any preferences files, uh, plist files where you store some user information, um, SQLite databases, stuff like that. Firebase uh, databases, for example, can be here as well. So this would be the place where all the data files are. So in this case, since we are looking for 
the info pill is that is going to be on the bundle, on the actual code uh, of the application where the binaries are and so on. So this is the bundle directory. So I'm going to click on this or tap on this. And now I'm going to tap uh, on the application here. And then I can scroll down and try to find the info pill list, right? So this is the info pill list here. So I'm going to tap on this. And then you can see that with fields that we can open plist files natively. So I need to expand this to try to find uh, the URL handler. So now we can see here uh, the entries. And now this starts to get interesting, right? CF bundle URL types. So I tap on this, then I tap on item zero. And here we can see the bundle uh, URL schemes. So we can see them vulnerable and secure, but then vulnerable and secure at Swift. So this is another way to check for custom URL handlers um, on iOS uh, if you have a jailbroken device, right? Uh, and we didn't even open the app. This is just looking at the info list um, using Fields app. Fields is really a really powerful tool. We use it for a lot of things uh, during the course. Okay, so that's about how to find the URL handlers. And then now we're going to attack here uh, or down vulnerable applications. So let me see. I think here I already have this open. So I'm going to um, check this, right? So here we have the vulnerable and secure at Swift and then phone call number. So if I tap on the first URL and I hit here open, you can see here success calling this number ring ring, right? So it's uh, making the call to the, um, to the phone number using the URL handler. And then if I use the second URL, it's going to do the same thing, right? So we have two URL handlers for the same thing. So this is doing the, uh, the calling as well. Okay, now I don't know if um, you want to uh, try this one or not. So maybe we leave uh, another five minutes for, for you to try this out. Does anybody have a, an iOS device or do you prefer to move on? Let me check the chat. I have currently no sound. Okay, but all the people can, can hear fine. Yeah, so I think that should be okay. But do you want me to move on or do you have a, an iOS device? Do you want to try this exercise first? Does somebody have an iOS device? I uh, want to try this exercise. No apples in my house. But if you prefer, we can, yeah, if you prefer, we can move on. And then, yeah, if you don't have a, an iOS device, I can just move on and you can try this one when you get one or something. You have access to all this from, uh, from the slides and so on, and you will also have the recording already. Cool, then let's move on. If, this, if nobody says anything, then I'm going to move on. Let's give maybe six more seconds. <laughs> to answer the question. Okay, to move on. Okay, then I'm going to move on. I'm going to assume nobody has uh, an iOS device, cool. Um, okay, so we saw um, custom URL handler. So now let's talk about uh, sexy URI scheme attacks. So um, this was a browser application with a custom URL handler. Um, so basically an application like Chrome and so on but on, on the mobile device, and then it has some custom URL handler because it's a browser, right? So it needs to open um, URLs that are sent to it. So and does anybody uh, see a problem with this, uh, the vulnerability here? Let me open the chat. Does anybody see the vulnerability? Nobody for squeezing browser. Very good. Uh, you're really smart today. So I didn't, uh, last week I, I gave this workshop uh, somewhere else and people were not guessing all the questions like today. So very good. Uh, see this uh, quite a good level in the OWASP uh, check, uh, chapter. So yeah, very good. This is for squeezing the browser. 
And basically, because the internet browser is going to browse to uh, any any website, right? So it could be an attacker website, and then the attacker website can have um, a, a HTML like this, right? So you can have in, in your website you put something like image source, and then Onion Browser colon for script, and then this is going to for script the the browser, right? So this is bad because you get the you know an arbitrary page that the uh, that the application is opening to to run like commands that are meant to be used uh, internally by the application, right? So this is the code handling this. So it's checking if the location has uh, for quit uh, for squid somewhere. So it's doing location different than not found. So it's kind of the double negation, a little bit weird, but basically it's saying uh, for squid is part of the string or for squid found, right? So not not found is found. So uh, is saying is if Foursquit is found in the location, then uh, it will do all this. And here you can see it's doing the the Foursquit, right? So it is has like all the code for uh, doing that, right? So how to uh, mitigate this kind of um, issue, right? So at the minimum, you should prompt the user before quitting. Like, do you really want to uh, quit the browser? If possible, eliminate the Foursquit functionality. Uh, and then you should have a separate uh, screen flow uh, for the help area, which websites cannot invoke, right? So the menu of the application should not be exposed to arbitrary websites that the browser is visiting. It should be like limited to the application itself, right? So it should not be possible to invoke the, the deep link URLs from inside of a, a page that you are visiting. Uh, if you have like a browser application and this browser application opens HTML file that could uh, an HTML from a website that is potentially untrusted, uh, you should not just uh, you know run everything in there um, and so on. And then in general, also in iOS, very important, uh, consider universal links as custom URLs can be hijacked and are insecure, right? So custom URLs, uh, as we saw in the demo before. Uh, you could have uh, another application registering, for example, dumb vulnerable in Secure App Swift, uh, and then whenever uh, this URL is invoked, then maybe the other application would be uh, called instead of dumb vulnerable in Secure App, right? Because any application can register these custom URLs, whereas universal links, there's a bit more validation there, where uh, to register a universal link, you have to like validate your domain, and then Apple is going to check that the domain is really validated for this universal link before uh, sending it to the application. So this is a bit safer in terms of not other applications can register this URL, but uh, this does not mean that you can still use universal links for deep link attacks if the application is doing something uh, stupid or has some kind of security mistake or vulnerability, right? So uh, what universal links protect you from is that uh, there's no hijacking possible. Like uh, Apple will validate that the universal link really belongs to your application. Uh, as, and this is not possible with custom URLs, right? So that is the main uh, advantage. So now let's talk about uh, logic bugs, right? So logic bugs are often um, subtle issues. They are sometimes hard to find and almost always missed by automated tools, right? So this is one of the things why you really need humans to, to pen test uh, uh, applications and so on, right? Because uh, a, a tool is almost never going to find a, a logic bug. So in this case, we have an application and it needs to have uh, JavaScript disabled by default. And um, this is how it's trained to do it, right? So when you open the preferences, um, you can see that uh, JavaScript is disabled here in the user interface, and this is the code handling whether JavaScript is disabled uh, or not. Does anybody see a problem with this? Let me move this here, maybe. JavaScript disabling not working? Yes, but why? Why is JavaScript disabling not working?
any guesses? It's just one line of code. It's not uh, too big. Okay, let's give it 10 more seconds. You can see how this thing is a little bit tricky to spot, right? So if you have a lot of source code and so on, this could be very easily missed. JavaScript disabled, not working, always enabled. Um, kind of, yes. Yeah. So this is done only on startup. It's kind of related to that, yes. Yeah. So let me let me show you, right? So. So yeah, you're kind of right. The problem here is um, the user interface, you have enabled JavaScript and it shows you that it is disabled, but then the code that actually figures out whether JavaScript is disabled or not is doing it this way, right? It tries to guess the preference and then, so it gets the preference from somewhere. And then here we have the, the true parameter is saying that if you cannot get this preference, then it's going to default to true. So even though the user interface showed that it was disabled, in practice, it was enabled by default, right? Then if you enabled it and then disabled it, then it would be fine because this uh, place where the preference was, then it was uh, existing, right? But in, uh, in the beginning, the problem was since the preference was missing on the XML file, uh, then the user interface was showing that JavaScript was disabled, but in practice, it was enabled, right? So it's a very subtle um, security bug, right? A logic bug. So yeah, this is the issue, right? So it's getting the preference and then it's defaulting to true if the preference cannot be read, right? So this is a quick proof of concept to read like the cookies and so on. So this is the, the alert of, uh, you know, being able to verify that, uh, you know, we can run JavaScript and then how to fix this, right? So, um, Instead of uh, defaulting to true, you should default to false, right? So try to um, default to, to to more secure settings, right? So uh, that will be one way. But in this case, another thing is that you should ensure the preferences are set in the preference file. So in, the, in this case, the main issue was the, the JavaScript uh, setting was missing on the preference file. So this code was falling into defaulting to true, right? So you could fix it by defaulting to false, but you should also uh, ensure that JavaScript uh, is set in the preference file so you don't have like this subtle kind of issues, right? And then default to the most secure setting instead. So in this case, default to false. So let's talk about URL validation. Does anybody see a problem with this? Any guesses about what's wrong with this? Let me open the chat here. Let's give this a few more seconds. Any guesses about what the vulnerability is on this one? Nobody ignoring of SSL warnings on domains that are not onion. You are very close. So any URL containing onion ignores SSL errors. Yes. So uh, that is that is actually the um, that is actually the problem. So any URL containing dot onion ignores SSL errors. Exactly. Well, very well put. So yes, this is the problem, right? So we have here. URL host, so this part is fine, right? So you should always use the, um, the URL parsing thing from the operating system or the platform you're using. So this is good that the application is using the URL host as parsed by iOS, as opposed to using some dirty uh, regular expression or some other uh, way to parse the URL that is non-standard. That could be a, a, a lot of trouble potentially. So this part is good, but then the issue is here, right? So this is doing range of string dot onion dot location different than not found. So again, not not is equal to yes. So uh, so this is checking that dot onion 
So if dot onion is found, then it's ignoring uh, SSL errors, right? So if dot onion is present in the host part of the URL, then it will ignore SSL errors. So what is the problem here? This is just checking that dot onion is present, uh, but it is not checking that it is at the end of the URL. So as long as dot onion appears somewhere of the URL, we can get uh, the application to bypass, uh, you know, to ignore SSL errors. So what can um, what can we do with this, right? So we can ignore SSL warnings on non-onion domains. So for example, uh, to demonstrate this during the process, we did this, right? So we uh, we created a subdomain, so www.paypal.com.onion.7-a.org. So this was, uh, you know, a domain uh, that has dot onion somewhere. It's not at the end. It's not an onion server, but it has dot onion, right? So this is going to uh, to fall into the ignore SSL errors. Yes, because it contains dot onion somewhere, right? It contains dot onion in the middle of the URLs. Now, because of the, the uh, screens and so on uh, on mobile devices, maybe uh, only PayPal.com is shown, right? And then this could be bad, or maybe only uh, the end of the URL is shown. So. Uh, you could have there some possible uh, interesting issues uh, on the uh, user interface for kind of spoofing purposes. But the thing is, if you open this URL on a normal browser, you're going to get security warnings. But when you open this URL on the Onion browser, this was a, an old version, right? So this was all patched. Um, if you visited this on the Onion browser, then you would get uh, no warnings, right? So this is a very common issue, uh, a very common uh, logic bug in uh, a lot of uh, applications, right? So this is going to depend on the platform, but basically any check that checks if a string is part of another string, it can sometimes be a security problem, right? So if you use includes, contains, string string or similar, or string comp or something like this, so if you use uh, something like that, there could be problems in situations where what you really should be verifying is whether some string starts with a given string or ends with a, a given string. So in this case, it should check that the URL host ends with a dot onion, right? So uh, this is why this attack was working. So this report is actually public, so you can read it here for more information. So how to fix this, right? So in this case, the application needs to ignore SSL warnings for dot onion domains because dot onion domains like work in a different way, right? So you cannot use like normal SSL validation on those. So that was what the application was trying to do. So how could you uh, implement this properly so there's no vulnerabilities? You could check uh, that the URL hostname ends with dot onion. So you should check that it's actually ending and not containing dot onion somewhere. So this alone would fix the problem, but then you could also verify that the .onion domain is actually running an Onion server and not just, you know, a normal, uh, and it's not just a normal website. So you could also have like an additional check for that uh, just to make sure, right? So this could be a valid way uh, to fix it. So now let's talk about man in the middle attacks. So um, this was a secure uh, messenger app. And with Messenger apps, uh, there is this protocol called uh, XMPP. So it's an XML uh, protocol that basically Jabber uses, uh, you know, uh, Facebook chat, uh, Google chat, uh, pretty much uh, every chat uh, platform is using XMPP under hood. So these are very popular uh, things. So when you're trying to man in the middle, this one trick that you can do is to do this in a pen test, right? So you can, uh, as the fake server, um, you can say something like this, like you can authenticate to me, but the only uh, mechanism that I have for authentication is plain. So only you have to send me the credentials in, in plain text because that's the only mechanism I, I have. So that is what this is saying to the client, right? So then the, the victim mobile application, uh, in this case, sent us the credentials uh, in plain text. So you can see here, this is doing mechanism plain, and then this is like base64 encoded. But if you decode it, you can basically see uh, you can basically see that this uh, string decodes to this. So uh, the attacker basically could um, harvest the credentials of uh, victim users of this application using man in the middle, right? So this is a quick trick for a fallback mechanism. I know this technique sometimes works also for uh, mobile, uh, for email protocols, right? So you could also try it 
uh, if you are testing a, an email application, you could try it on POP3, IMAP, uh, and other uh, you know, email protocols like that, SMTP. And you could try uh, to see if the application is going to accept some uh, clear text mechanism, right? So it's a, a, an interesting thing uh, to check if you can. To fix this, uh, you should always tunnel everything over TLS where possible. So TLS will take care of uh, confidentiality, integrity, and so on. There's no need for you to uh, all you know do all that on your own because TSL takes care of it. So you should always use TLS. Then, if possible, use pinning as well. So that will be even better. I'll talk more uh, about pinning. Uh, a bit later and then if tls is unavailable uh, refuse to connect and don't allow clear text fallbacks right so this will be uh, the main way uh, to fix this now let's talk about right? because uh, mobile applications uh, can also and desktop applications as well, they can also check for updates, right? So there's, there's going to be maybe some check in the background. There should be some check to see if there's an update available and then from the user like, hey, do you want to update the app? There's a new version, whatever. Uh, so this should be something like this, right? So in this case, um, we were testing an application and it was checking for updates. And this is how uh, the check for updates uh, looked like. So does anybody see the problem here? Anything wrong with this? This is how the update is being requested. So this is what the HTTP request uh, looks like. HTTP protocol, correct. So yeah, this is using clear text HTTP, right? So this means if the user is on public Wi-Fi and there's no guest isolation, then any malicious user inside of the same network can, uh, you know, uh, do money in the middle and spoof the response from the server. And instead of not found, it can reply to, you know, with a, a fake update, right? So in this case, um, in this case, we have this, right? So, um, we can get, uh, you know, send a thing update that is really uh, not a URL to download any app, but actually a premium phone number, right? So we have the request, which is clear text HTTP, so we can run in the middle and spoof it. Uh, and then here we have the response now instead of being not found, right? So this was what the server was saying before, not found. The attacker can change it to uh, OK. And then uh, this is the format of the update. So version two is available. It is a forced update. So forced equal one. So this means that user cannot do anything until they update the app. And then the URL to uh, retrieve the update is this one, right? So in practice, this meant that the user got a message like this, new version available, new version. And then whenever you clicked on update, then it was calling uh, the, the phone number, right? So this is a way in which you could do like premium phone calls, uh, for example, to monetize uh, an attack, right? So an interesting bug and another way in which, uh, you know, you can uh, abuse uh, updaters, right? Or, or get the application to call premium phone numbers. So how to fix this, right? So you should take for updates over TLS. So that's first, right? So you should always do these things securely then. Uh, you should also consider uh, pinning. So TLS will protect you against average attackers not able to forge a certificate trusted by iOS or Android, but it will not protect you from uh, big companies or big governments, right? So those governments and some companies can uh, forge a valid SSL uh, certificate for google.com or for facebook.com or any other domain.com, right? Um, and then also, if you look at the trusted certification authorities in your browser, maybe you don't really trust uh, some of them, right? So you have the Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh, post office there, as well as uh, many other countries that you may or may not trust, right? So um, to solve that, uh, you could also uh, implement pinning, right? So with pinning, what you're doing is, I'm not going to just trust that the certificate is valid. I'm going to check that the certificate is actually the certificate that I know my server uses, right? So in this case, you no longer trust in the certification authorities. You're only trusted in the certificate that you know you have on the server. So this completely prevents um, man in the middle. 
right for from a, a high profile kind of attacker like able to forge a certificate trusted by android or ios so for example companies like trustwave then um, a few years ago uh, some certification authorities were hacked uh, some example of this was DigiNoter, was a certification authority that was hacked, I think 2011 was a very famous case, and then attackers were able to forge a certificate trusted by any domain on the internet. Right? So this has all happened, right, that this has been used somehow. So with pinning, you would pro provide protection against this. Then once you do that, uh, you can also check that the update URL is really a URL and not a phone number, right? So this is a, an important check to, to have as opposed to just opening the whatever URL comes, and then verify that the updated URL matches some uh, trusted domains. So you should not trust the update from any domain on the internet. You probably expect the update to be delivered to a, specifically, a specific domain that you own. So you should not uh, you know, receive updates from uh, random internet domains, right? And then very important as well to sign and verify the signature uh, of the update check and then sign and verify the signature of the update itself right so whenever the server tells you that uh, there's an update available then this response from the server could be uh, signed uh, and then the the mobile phone the mobile application should be able to verify the signature to make sure that this is actually valid. This is uh, not like an attack. This is actually a legitimate uh, signed, digitally signed uh, update uh, response. Like the update is available uh, from the server, right? And then you can also like sign and verify the signature of the update itself prior to running it. So if you if you run a, a, an iOS device, you would see whenever you update iOS, it will say you will see a message like verifying signature before doing anything else. It's just verifying that the signature uh, is correct from Apple, right? So you should do the same with applications whenever there's a, an update before you run it. You should always check that the update actually matches the signature, right? Now let's look at another example, right? So in this case, we have a third party file retrieval. So um, we had a, an iOS application and it was using a, a library that was retrieving a, a zip file uh, from the internet and then uh, and compressing it and doing things with it. So that is the scenario uh, for the next, um, the next vulnerability that we're going to talk about. So does anybody see uh, any problem with this? Does anybody see the uh, potential vulnerability here? Any ideas? Anybody? give this maybe 10 more seconds insecure HTTP loads permitted resources can be loaded from HTTP yes yeah, so Eva is correct uh, and yeah it's fallback fallback to HTTP is not really a fallback it's really the exception is kind of giving you a hint here right so Insecure HTTP loads permitted. So let me explain that. Um, but the yeah, Eva is right. So um, so yeah, you are correct. Right? So uh, in uh, iOS uh, version nine, Apple introduced uh, App Transport Security. So uh, App Transport Security basically ensures that uh, mobile applications on iOS cannot make any clear text HTTP uh, connection to anything. Right, so by default, they are only allowed to use uh, HTTPS or secure kind of HTTPS URL. So this is good, right? But then on the info P list of the application, uh, developers can uh, create exceptions for app transport security. So this is one of those cases. So in this case, even though iOS prevents clear text HTTP connections, here we can see that this application, for some reason, has app transport security and then it says exception domain so it's defining the domains where app transport security can be bypassed so it's in this case it was a, an amazon aws domain s3 domain and then 
here is setting NS temporary exceptions that allows insecure HTTP load. So this is allowing clear text HTTP to this host, right? So then the question uh, for you is, well, what does the application, what is the application doing in this domain that it needs to set this exception, right? So this gives you some hints as a pen tester, like, well, maybe the application is making some clear text HTTP uh, request here. So what is the application checking? And then in your reversing and looking at the source code and so on, you look for hints about uh, where this domain is used and then try to see uh, if there's, you know, if you can find the, the URL uh, that is being checked and what it is used for, or as you man in the middle, you would pay a closer attention to uh, this URL to try to find this clear text HTTP uh, connection. In this case, we had an arbitrary file overwrite because the application, or basically not the application itself, but a library that the application was using, was retrieving uh, a zip file over clear text HTTP like this, right? So this was the Amazon AWS domain, and then there was some path, and then the zip file that it was downloaded over clear text HTTP. So with this, uh, an attacker could, uh, you know, like op open Wi-Fi, no guest isolation. So an attacker can replace this uh, zip file uh, as the application uh, downloads it, and then the attacker can overwrite uh, arbitrary uh, app files, right? So any file um, in the zip file can be replaced you can even use like uh, dodgy file names on the zip file like dot dot slash something and then like navigate out of the directory where the application was intending to save the files and probably uh, do some damage that way right so this was a, a nice uh, arbitrary file right thanks to using clear text http but the hint was on the info p list with this exception this is what pointed us in the right direction right so um methodology wise to explain things a bit how you would probably go about finding these things right so how to fix this uh, avoid weakening a ATS right so ATS is an abbreviated version of calling a app transport security in iOS so you should not enable any exceptions uh, actually if you add exceptions this could trigger a, a review in the app store and then maybe uh, you, you know your application could be sometimes taken down or you could be asked questions like why do you need to do this uh, and so on. So these, uh, you know, there's another set of problems uh, in addition to security that could come uh, with this, right? And then use dependencies that use secure uh, TLS communications, right? So this would be, uh, you know, the main ways uh, to fix this. Of course, you could also uh, implement pinning and so on if you are doing this from the application itself. In this case, because it was a library, you would have less control. Uh, now let's talk about an interesting implementation of SSL security warnings. So we have application, in this case it's Android, and it is uh, checking when a certificate um, is invalid, right? So we have these uh, try-catch, uh, usual try-catch in Java, right? And then when there is a certificate exception, then this is asking the user, what do you want to do, right? The certificate is valid, so you know, do you want to accept it or not, right? So this is the logic, right? So it's catching the exception and then it's just asking the users until here, there's uh, no vulnerability per se on this part, right? But, uh, you know, we we have this functionality. And then it's showing a warning to the user, I accept a known certificate, and then you have always, once, or abort, right? So you have these options and the application is waiting for an answer. So this is how the application is waiting for the answer to this dialog to say always once or abort. It's registering a receiver on the fly, right? So this alone tells you that whenever you do uh, an Android uh, security review or pen test, you need to you need to look at the source code, right? Because you would never find this receiver on the Android manifest alone. So if all you do is look at the Android manifest, you are going to completely miss this, right? Because there's another option to uh, register uh, receivers like dynamically uh, on the source code itself. So in this case, you have master register receiver, and then here you have decision receiver, new that filter, uh, and so on, right? So this is registering the receiver on the fly. So you, you are going to never see this receiver on the Android manifest. And then this is basically uh, starting the activity uh, for the user interface prompt to the user, and then waiting for the choice 
and then uh, at the end once the choice is received then it unregisters the receiver right so there's a receiver that is registered on the fly and then unregistered uh, after the choice has been uh, received right so this is a, an interesting uh, approach to handling uh, user dialogues um, and you need to start thinking what the vulnerability could be here right so you have a, a, a receiver here right and then this is waiting for the choice and then at the end of the choice is uh, unregistering the receiver right and this is how the actual processing works right so um, this is the the user answer is receiving the intent for the receiver uh, and then here you have uh, get intent extra decision id get intent extra decision choice so it's saving these uh, into variables and then at the end of doing all this stuff it will store the certificate if the decision is always right so we had this uh, on the dialog always trust the certificate so if the decision is always then the certificate will be stored uh, permanently uh, and with this uh, the user will not be prompted again uh, if the same certificate is found again you say okay this is the the user wants to trust this one right so it will not prompt the user again so after explaining all this what do you think is the vulnerability here? Any guesses about what could go wrong with this? Let me go back here to this slide to make it a little bit easier. Right, so what could go wrong with this? Any guesses? Five more seconds. Nobody? Okay, so the issue here <clears throat> is that this receiver that we have here it not only it will not only just receive a broadcast from uh, the user dialog here, but it will also receive broadcast from any other application on the phone. So if you have a malicious application installed on the phone, you can send. A you could have, for example, in the background, you could always be sending intense, like you could always be sending broadcasts uh, like this, right? So you do, you can simulate it with ADB shell. So you can do ADB shell broadcast and then the, uh, the application, and then you send the decision ID and then decision choice to always trust all the certificates, right? So you could have this in the background and then the user is never going to see uh, this message because it's going to be clicking on always all the time, right? So the user will not even see this because this always is going to be clicked so quickly because this application is sending this uh, broadcast uh, request all the time, right? So it's sending this broadcast intent all, intents all the time. Yes, the receiver will not be up uh, most of the time, but when it is, then uh, you will say always to trust all the certificates, right? So you have a permanent man in the middle prompt bypass uh, with this, right? So it was a, an interesting attack, right? So, how to actually uh, fix this, right? So you could use a local broadcast receiver using a local broadcast manager instead of broadcast receiver. So you can read more about this. So this in turn uh, limits the requests uh, of the application, right? So only um, you could only send them if you have a local broadcast manager, uh, then only requests from the actual application. So you can notice the local here. So only a request or broadcast request from the local application will be accepted as opposed to any other application on the phone, right? So this alone will be enough, but uh, if you must use the broadcast receiver, then you could protect it with a permission. So only applications signed by the same developer certificate can call it. And then if you must use the broadcast receiver, you could consider making the decision ID an unpredictable random token instead of a sequential ID. So with this last uh, mitigation strategy, what we achieve is that, yes, uh, maybe some malicious application is sending this um, 
broadcast all the time, but they will not be able to guess the, the, the send the correct uh, decision ID, right? So this could be another uh, possible mitigation strategy where possible try to implement all the mitigations, but this would be some guidelines to uh, mitigate this. So now let's talk about uh, man in the middle of XMPP, right? So uh, with XMPP, we talked about it before a little bit. So uh, this is this useful protocol for chat applications, right? So chat.facebook.com and uh, you know, the Gmail also has a chat. So it all works with XMPP, Java, another very popular um, tool that uses this. So uh, when we are trying to man in the middle of this, we want something like this, right? So we want the XMPP in clear text between the victim uh, phone at the server and then uh, and the attacker uh, controlled the uh, you know uh, machine and then from here we can do like the xmpp over ssl with the actual server but then this way we can man in the middle everything right so uh, one way to test for problems with this uh, is to use prosody right so what we did in our test was to set up Prosody, it's very easy to set up. It's a, an XMPP server written in Lua. It will use a self-signed certificate by default, and then you can configure the virtual host. Right. So here we have chat.facebook.com, gmail.com, and jabber.org. So we have virtual hosts for all of these. Uh, and then using DNS spoofing, we uh, we got the mobile application to instead of go to the legitimate server, go to our own uh, Prosody server. Uh, and then try to uh, to see if the application would authenticate. So in this case, we actually got uh, the application to log into Prosody uh, without uh, any kind of uh, user warnings on the phone, right? So, um, so yeah, it worked with the default self-signed certificate straight away, right? So this is a quick way for you to to test for XMPP issues, right? So a different way than what we saw before with the um, uh, saying that only plain text is allowed, so this would be using a, a self-signed certificate for um, ex for the XMPP server, right? So you need to add a visual host entry for each domain that you wish uh, Prosody to serve. So you need visual host for each of the domains. It is going to depend on the application you're testing, and then settings under each virtual host uh, entry apply only to that host. Um, and yeah, and it worked uh, the first time we tried. So this was actually quite nice, right? So this can be helpful if you if you're facing a test that has some sort of a chat functionality. You could try to man in the middle like MPP this way. So now let's talk about clear text HTTP communications uh, in Android, right? So does anybody see uh, the problem with this? Any guesses? Again, HTTP protocol, yes. But what can we do with it? So that is the first part. We have clear text HTTP, so we can spoof this XML file. But then this XML file, uh, XXC, looking, moving in the right direction. Yeah, it could be uh, something like this, but file, it's more like file overwrite. Yeah, directory traversal file overwrite. Uh, in this case, it was uh, directory traversal. So in this case, we have a clear text HTTP, right? Uh, and this is retrieving some XML file from the server. And then this is doing like to download file name uh, is a field that contains the file name of the file that is going to be saved. And this is retrieved from the XML. And the contents of the file are also retrieved from the XML. And then we have code like this, like file media file, and then new file of the media directory and then the, the file name, and then the safe contents, which are the... Con so the attacker controls everything, right? So controls the full file name, the full contents uh, of the file that will be created. So what can we do with this? So in this case, uh, the application was uh, another uh, whistleblower uh, applications, different than the, the one that we saw before. And yeah, basically this was like trying to get uh, people to report human rights violations. Um, so you could like uh, change this XML because it was making the request over clear text HTTP. Uh, and then using this attack, we could modify the preference file of the application 
to uh, for an attacker to receive human rights violation reports forever, right? So we achieve permanent permanent man in the middle using an arbitrary file, right? So it's a inter very interesting bug. The first thing to mention is that this media file uh, in the XML was actually not used at all by the application. This was uh, an extension um, of the library that the application was using. So we researched the, the library with which this XML file was being processed, and we saw that there was this media file option in the uh, supported by this library, right? So even though uh, the application was not using this at all, we could uh, inject this XML inside of uh, the intended XML, and then we could write arbitrary files with this. So this was a very cool bug because of this reason, that the application wasn't really using this media file functionality at all, but uh, we could still exploit it because the library was supporting this, right? So this was a very cool bug. And then uh, on the file name, we can use a path traversal, right? So we can provide a dot dot slash sequence to navigate outside of the um, SD card uh, directory and into the uh, protected storage of the application. So we are, we are going to create a new uh, preferences file, right? So we have the vulnerable app and then share preferences and then a preferences.xml. Now, since we control the file name we can and the contents, we can also specify a valid hash for it. So this is absolutely not providing any security at all because we can provide a, a matching uh, hash. So this will be fine. And then we can provide the download URL for the actual uh, contents uh, of the file. So with this, we could provide a forged uh, preference file where the server URL is some attacker.com uh, submit to submit the human rights violations. And then, you know, if a malicious government uh, used this vulnerability, they could uh, man in the middle, uh, you know, receive all the um, uh, human rights violation reports, the oppressive regime that you're trying to fight against would be the one able to receive all the human rights violation reports, right? So exactly what you do not want is what uh, an oppressive kind of regime could achieve with this vulnerability. It was a really cool bug, so I think it was pretty good that we caught it before uh, this was used uh, in the field. Um, but yeah, very uh, interesting uh, kind of issue, especially given that the, it was functionality not used by the application, but by a library that the application was using, right? So yeah, always try to get creative, right? If you can get an arbitrary file, right? Try to think like, can update? Can I update the preference file of the application? And with that, maybe can I do uh, more damage with that, right? So that that's also something uh, to think about, right? So. Um, this is how the attack looked in practice. So we can see uh, that it was being to try, first it was deleting the file and then it was copying over the file. So you can see here that with the dot dot slash, we navigate out of the SD card and into the private storage of the app. So first it deletes the uh, previous uh, preference file and then it starts downloaded to uh, SD card uh, and then it copies over the file uh, so we basically overwrite the preferences of the application and one of the preferences was the server URL where human rights violations were being reported to. So with this, we could uh, man in the middle uh, or receive, like an attacker could receive all the human rights violations, right? So very serious stuff. So how to fix this? Uh, you should validate the file name uh, against a wide list of characters. Well, before all this, uh, one thing that we should mention is in this case, because uh, this was from a feature of a library that uh, the application was using, the application code actually did not have any control over this at all. So you would need to either use another library or disable that kind of functionality in the library or something like that, right? So this was a very subtle kind of issue, right? Uh, and then if you were doing this on your own, then yes, then you would have to do something like this. So you have to validate the file name against a wide list of characters. So for example, only allow letters and numbers and dots, but nothing else. And then very important when you're using regular expressions, use the start and the end of the string, right? Because sometimes people uh, use a regular expression and they forget one or the other, and then you can, you know, uh, find bypasses that way, right? So very important to always use the start and the end to make sure that the entire string matches the regular expression that you intend when you're using them for validation. 
use TLS. Uh, it's free now, right? So you could use Let's Encrypt. You could also use other providers, just an example, but uh, it's not no excuse that it costs money. It doesn't cost money anymore, so just use TLS. And then consider pinning to protect from high-profile attackers. So OWAS has a very nice uh, cheat sheet explaining pinning with Android and iOS examples. So you can take a look at that. It's pretty good. Um, so with this, now let's do a couple more uh, demos, right, with this. So we're going to check XSS attacks and data exfiltration uh, on Android and iOS. So um, we're going to do first web use and data exfiltration on Android, and then we will do it uh, on iOS. So let's see, um, let's see how this looks, right? So we have um, web views. Uh, so you might have heard about them. They are basically like a, a small browser kind of that the application has. And then this small browser can open web pages, can open HTML, and then depending on the security features that he has uh, enabled or not, they can be uh, security problems, right? So um, a web view in Android is basically a native uh, Android object that acts like a miniature uh, web browser, which can load web content like HTML and JavaScript within the context of an Android activity. Uh, web views are useful when you need to have uh, extensive control over the web content being loaded. Uh, and then there's some interesting web view properties, right? So web views can have as many permissions as the app that includes it. Uh, they can be explicitly enabled to execute uh, JavaScript. They can load local as well as remote web content. And then native Android functions can sometimes be accessed from web views with the help of JavaScript. So you can define JavaScript interfaces where Using JavaScript, you can call Java, and sometimes with this, they can be like interesting uh, bugs as well. So, what can we do with web views? Like normally, from an attacker perspective, there's uh, there's different things, right? That um, different uh, common uh, attack scenarios. So, one possibility is HTML injection. Now, this should not be, uh, you know, underappreciated, right? So, sometimes. When you think, well, but it's not XSS, it's just HTML injection. Yes, but if with the HTML injection, you can put together a, a believable um, fake login page that sends credentials to an attacker, that can still be pretty serious, even though it's just HTML injection, right? So that's something to bear in mind. Then another thing is, uh, if we actually have full-blown XSS, then we can change the page, we can invoke functionality from JavaScript, so things get a lot more interesting, of course. Um, and then in some cases, depending on the web view settings, we can also uh, do data exfiltration of local files. So we are going to see examples of this uh, in Android and iOS in the next exercises and demos. So I think you will find this very interesting. And then another possibility is possible user impersonation using cross-site requests uh, through XSS, depending on the application, right? So if you have XSS, maybe you can read the page where a cross site request forgery token is, and then have cross site request forgery that way on the web server side of uh, things, um, you know, using XSS on the mobile app. So sometimes this can be possible, right? So this is another thing to think about when you're exploring uh, XSS in WebView. So for this exercise that I'm going to cover now, and I will demo now in a moment. We will use Android Goat. So this is the official uh, project page, but um, this exercise will not work with the, with the public version of Android Goat. So we uh, modified it um, to, to be more interesting uh, for this particular exercise. So you need to use the one in the training portal. So at this stage, everybody should have access. Uh, if not, just email uh, admin at 7 securitycom and we'll give you access. So no problem with that. Or even if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, email admin at and we will give you access. This is a free workshop, right? Uh, and then you uh, download the slides, and then from the slides, click on this link. This is the correct version to use. Uh, so once you install this application, you may need to, uh, on Android, uh, allow installation from untrusted sources uh, to be able to install uh, this APK. So you have to go to settings and then uh, allow installation from trusted sources. Let me see if I can show you that. So if you're not, in case somebody is not very familiar with this, let me see where is this here. Settings. 
uh, and then here you would go to security um, and then there's always going to be something here right allow installation of apps from unknown sources now this is going to vary slightly depending on uh, the android phone you're using uh, for an android 6 uh, device it will be something like this right uh, so security uh, allow installation of apps from unknown sources this is something you will need to do uh, to install this app right because it has been modified it doesn't have like a valid uh, developer certificate it's not from the play store and so on so uh, always enable this when you are playing with uh, repackaging and so on so this is something you'll need to do okay so uh, yeah and then once you install it then you can like follow the steps that i'm going to explain now so first since we are going to do xss with data exfiltration First, we need to create some data files, right? So as we want to exfiltrate data, we need to create uh, the data first. We need to create some files that uh, for us to steal, right? So we uh, need to go to the insecure data storage area. So this is how the application uh, looks like. When you open it, you click on insecure data storage, and then we will use uh, share preferences part one and SQL Live. So uh, yeah, just go to share preferences part one. And then here we can specify username and a, a username and a password and we save this so this is going to create a, an xml file that has the user credentials uh, and then we repeat the steps for the sqlite data right? so we click on SQL live and then we put the user and the password and we hit uh, save so this will save uh, the credentials um, in the file system uh, in a, as a sqlite database so now those files are created we can try to uh, to steal them right so now we need to look at the xss so we need to uh, navigate to the input validation uh, xss exercise right so if you have done the full exercise before you will need to uh, delete the sd card html file from here so this is a tip if you do the exercise several times you, you may need to do that uh, and then click on input validation and then input validation exercise so this is how this looks like in practice right so this is the app click on input validations input validations XFS, and then here we can start experimenting with access right? so we can check first for html injection so we can use for example the h1 tag or the s tag for um, you know the strike through and try to see if uh, these html tags have some effect uh, on whatever we do so in this example, we can see that H1 results in a bigger string. So we have um, a hello with H1 tags here. And we can see that the hello is bigger. So this confirms that there's probably a HTML injection going on here. And then we can say, okay, if there's HTML injection, uh, do we have access as well? So we can try these payloads. We can do image source X on our alert one, or we can do script alert one. So we can try this uh, and see uh, if this works, right? If this, if we get a, an alert. Um, so when we try this, you will see that we get here uh, the number one. So we are getting the the alert. So this confirms we actually have XSS, right? And then the next question is. Well, we got XSS and this is nice, but uh, what is the security context in which uh, this XSS is running? And for that, we need to alert the location, right? Because the location is going to tell us if this is a file URL. In the case of uh, iOS, if this is an Apple Web Data URL or uh, some other uh, URL that is more privileged, right? So this will tell us if, uh, you know, the URL is interesting uh, in that way. So yeah, we can do this uh, alert location for, for that, right? So we have here the uh, script alert location. You can try it on the internal storage or the external storage. It doesn't really matter uh, for this particular part of the exercise. So you will see that we have a file URL for the internal storage. And in this case, this is the path of the internal storage, like data user, and then OWASP, uh, SAT, AGOAT, and then app with data, xss.html. So this is the location from where this uh, insecure web view is being loaded. And then this is the location of, uh, the, of the one from the external storage, right? So you have file storage emulated, and then uh, Android, blah, 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 and XSS external HTML, right? So this is the other file. So in both cases, we can see they are using file URLs. So at this stage, you should get excited because 
this means that probably we can steal local files depending on the uh, settings of the webview but it is a privileged uh, url so by default it will not have uh, any kind of same origin policy uh, restrictions so we should be able to read local files and send them to an attacker so it, this makes the xss much more interesting when it, it starts with file so yeah uh, from that uh, we have already alerted the location of the file we can clearly see that the source code is loaded from two different locations so we have the internal storage and the external storage so the path is slightly different right one if there is the protected android storage and the other one is the external storage which when you if you remember about what i explained about the sd card before you can start seeing some problems here as well uh, and then uh, yeah the application has access to both uh, storage contexts so the web view has as much access uh, as the application, right? So if the application can write to the SD card, then uh, depending on the settings uh, with the web view, you should also be able to like, read files from the SD card, for example, right? And then uh, for data exfiltration with XSS, uh, now we have confirmed we have XSS and now we have, we want to like steal local files and send them to an attacker, right? So this is the data exfiltration path using XSS. So first, we need to figure out the the file paths, right? Where where are these files uh, on the um, uh, on the on the application? So for that, we need to uh, you know if you have root access, you can do um, <clears throat> adb shell, and then you can cd on uh, data data, and then uh, the id of the application. So in this case, uh, os dot set a goat. And then once we're here, we can do find dot, and this will show us all the files uh, inside of these uh, directory and subdirectories. So this points us to the two files where we save the data, right? So one is shared preferences, users.xml, and the other is databases a goat. Of course, you will probably need to spend a little bit longer than this, uh, figuring this out. You will have to see, well, where, where did my data end up being saved to? Uh, a quick way to do this would be to uh, do a tar of all the files inside of this directory, download it into your computer, extract it, and then do a grep for your password. And then that will reveal all the locations in which your password was saved, for example, if it was in a log file or somewhere else. So that would be a, a faster uh, way to find uh, in which files, if any, uh, has my password been leaked, right? So tar tar all the files all the data files in ios you will do the same thing like do a, a tar jz of uh, all the files extract them locally and then grab for a password in all the files and then try to see if you get any any hits and if you get no hits then that's good news that the password is not saved on the uh, in clear text right then for doing the actual stealing now that we know uh, the full location of uh, these files um <clears throat> we can uh, specify this right so we can, can have a payload like script and then a new xml HTTP request and then open and then here we specify the full path of the users.xml file and then we send this request and we can alert it to prove that we can read it and then if uh, the contents of this file appear in the alert this means that we can uh, you know read uh this file from javascript which means in turn we can send it to an attacker which means we can like steal local files and send them to an attacker right so that is the point of all this uh, and then we can do the same with sqlite databases right so this a goat is a sqlite database so we can send the request and alert the response so that will also work right so if you uh, try the above payloads you will see how uh, the xss with the xss we're able to read those files and therefore we could also forward them to an attacker, hence proving that data exfiltration is possible. Right? So you have here uh, the payload, right? So you can add, uh, you can paste the payload in there, you hit display, and then this will show you um, the credentials in there. And then you can do the same with the external storage in here. This is doing the uh, SQLite database. So we can see here the SQLite database, right? So in both cases, we can see the credentials inside. You will maybe see this a little bit better when I do it now uh, in the demo. So uh, 
another possibility is uh, to steal system files or third-party app files, right? So if the application has access to the SD card, then we can read any file from the SD card as long as we know the location. So that is one possibility. Uh, and another possibility is to read system files like configuration files and so on to try to figure out what phone does the user have uh, and so on. So that's also possible. I'll show you now a couple of examples of this. So uh, if you have the Drosser agent app installed on the phone you're testing with, uh, you could uh, you could use this, right? So you can try to get this library, right? So Drosser installed this library with um, very uh, permissive permissions. So you can read this file from other apps. So um, if we can read this file, this means uh, we can steal files from other apps as well. And then in here, we can see that we can read uh, the custom uh, fi configuration file from a given phone, right? So you may also be able to read uh, other interesting phone paths, such as uh, system build prop, depending on the device used for testing, right? So there's uh, many files that you could try to read, but this is just some examples. So yeah, you can read files from system or from other apps. Uh, and this, this is how it looks in practice, right? So when you paste this payload, you can see here the contents. Uh, so this is a non-rooted phone. Uh, and this is showing you, uh, you know, like the contents of the, this configuration file, as well as the contents of this library that uh, Drosser uh, is using. Right, so in summary, uh, with access, we can exfiltrate application data files from the vulnerable app system files as long as they have permissions that allow other apps to read it right so as long as the application can read the file we should be able to read the system file we can read files from other apps as long as they have permissions that allow this and we can also read any sd card file uh, but the location needs to be known right the victim app needs to read access to the sd card so methodology wise you are looking to answer the following questions can we run arbitrary JavaScript? So if you get like an alert to pop out, then yes, then you can run JavaScript. Uh, then the next question is, okay, if we have JavaScript, under what context is JavaScript being executed? So with this alert location, we get a file URL. So this is a privileged context, not protected by the same origin policy, which means we can read local files uh, in principle, uh, web view settings. Then uh, if access is loaded from a privileged context, so file URL, can we read the uh, phone files and send them to the attacker, right? So that is what we are testing with this. Uh, we are trying to retrieve the user's XML as well as the SQLite uh, data, right? So, so if yes, this means we can read uh, app files and then internal device files and also files from other apps, right? So in this case, all these questions were successful. That methodology-wise, these are probably the steps that you would follow. Now, another interesting scenario is that uh, you saw this application is also reading files from the SD card. So in this case, you don't even need uh, the XSS because since the application is loading HTML file from uh, an HTML file from the SD card, any malicious app can uh, manipulate it, right? So we have the two scenarios we talked about before. A physical attacker with access can unplug the SD card, plug it into a computer, modify the HTML file, put some access in there, and you are accessed forever. That's one possibility. Another possibility, malicious application installed on the phone, access the, uh, the location of the HTML file, and then modifies it, right? So to illustrate this, we need to know uh, where in the SD card is this HTML file. So we can answer this question with the previous alert location. This is going to point us into the location of the SD card where this is done, right? So in this case, we have the script alert location, uh, and this is telling us the location on the SD card where this is. So once we know this, we can then uh, download this file, or we can modify it in place, or we can do ADB pull and retrieve it. We can also do a find uh, command on the SD card, and then this will show us uh, the files on the SD card, and there we will find the XSS file as well. So once we know the location, we can pull the file and change it locally, and then to simulate a, a malicious application of the phone with SD card access. So we can do a pull of the full where the HTML is, 
Uh, so you will see some output like this, one file pulled, and then we can now edit the, the file and add any XSS payload we want. So for example, here we can add um, you know, this uh, JavaScript payload here, and then this will run every time the application, uh, the relevant web view is being opened, right? So whenever this HTML is loaded, we will see um, this payload firing, right? So we have permanent XSS through manipulation of the SD card. So after that, change, we can push the file again. So you can do ADB push of this file inside of uh, this directory, and you will see some output like this. So one file pushed, uh, and then uh, you can see this here, right? So you do input validation, etc. So whenever you click on this, you will already get the pop out here. You will not have to paste anything here because now the XSS is persistent. It will happen all the time, right? So this is uh, the kind of attacker perspective exploitation side. And now let's talk about the root cause analysis or if you are doing code reviews, how to find this or uh, and so on, right? So if you, uh, one quick thing that you can do is to use MobSF. So uh, MobSF is a really cool tool. It will do a lot of uh, reversing for you. So in the case of Android applications, it will run APK tool and JDX, for example, automatically for you. Uh, so this is nice. Uh, and then the only issue is it saves things on this. Uh, if you're using a, a Kali Linux VM, for example, and you're running a MobSF, it will be uh, in the uploads directory like this. So you will have to sort by time so that the latest uh, upload is the latest hash. So this will be the latest application being uh, uploaded. So this is the ls-lt. So t is sorting by time, showing you the most recent uh, folder at the top. And then you can copy uh, this folder, something like this, right? So you can create some directory and then you copy uh, this uh, upload the directory into uh, and you call it decompiled uh, and then this is going to have all the decompiled resources like the apk tool output the uh, um, jdx output and, and so on as well as all the things that uh, mosf does right so now here you could like grab for external storage because we already saw on the screen that the application has uh, this external storage somewhere so this is going to point you to when this is being used um and then um, let's do another uh, guess so does anybody see the vulnerability here any guesses about what's wrong with this no html element validation yes there's no validation some people yeah don't based xss yes so um correct so you are right you're really good so yes you are right so basically we have document that's right so in analysis this is called a sink or a place where if you put user input here there can be problems right so this is a dom xss sync so if you put user input uh, inside our document dot write, then this can result in XSS. So we have DOM XSS here because A is uh, the input field where we are trying all our XSS from. So this is the actual root cause uh, of this issue that we are covering is this XSS in here, right? So uh, the source in this case is the text input where the user types and the sync uh, in this case is the document of write call right so this is the problem there's no validation there's no output encoding here and therefore there's a dom xss vulnerability so, <clears throat> we have a dom xss vulnerability because of document dot write right so we talked about that uh, and then what we can do is now search for uh, this uh, xssx.html for example because we know the name of the file where the html is we can try to search in the source code where this is. So in this case, this points us to an XSS activity.java. So we can try to take a look at this and see what's going on here, how this works. And here we can see all the insecure web, web view settings that this enables, thanks to which uh, this attack works with data exfiltration and so on, even on the latest Android, right? So we have uh, set JavaScript enabled to true, set allow universal access from file URLs to true, set allow file access from file URLs to true and set allow file access to true, right? So all these should be false uh, if possible. 
uh, and here because it is true this is what makes the web view so insecure right so we have two web views web settings one and web settings two and they are all enabling uh, these uh, insecure settings right so here we have the free file url so we have uh, the file uh, url here and then uh, there's um, a loading of uh, this file url right so by being a file url Again, this means no same origin policy, more privileges, and ability to read local files, especially with insecure uh, web view settings like this, right? So that is why uh, this attack works. So how to fix this, right? So to resolve issues like this, it's important to apply uh, as many of the following countermeasures as deemed feasible by the development team, right? So where possible, favor text views over web views because XSS is just not possible on, tech view, on text views, right? So if you use a text view, uh, then you should be fine. In some cases, this will be enough. So if you can do that, then do it. Uh, if you must use web views, then disable as many settings as possible. So especially JavaScript, all file access options, and any other uh, not strictly required functionality. So this is similar to, you know, the network uh, security recommendations, only, you know, have as few ports open as possible. Uh, so this is the same, right? Leave the minimum settings possible for the application to work, right? So the web view should have as few uh, features enabled as possible, the minimum possible features for the application to work as intended and everything else should be disabled. And this will ensure that, um, you know, uh, it will make uh, security vulnerabilities much more unlikely, right? That's uh, then you should also output encode user input prior to rendering it in a, in a web view. And avoid uh, DOM XSS things as much as possible, right? So if you Google DOM XSS wiki, you can see a full uh, list of DOM XSS things there. It hasn't been updated in a while, but it's still pretty, uh, you know, uh, accurate so you can uh, you can you can use that uh, to see you know valid uh, sources and things for sources would be places where user input can come from uh, in javascript and things would be places where uh, you know you could have xss problems uh, dom xss problems uh, with uh, javascript right so inner html location href there's a full list on the dom xss wiki uh, and then uh, you can also look at the OWASP XSS prevention cheat sheet for more mitigation guidance. So with this, let me do the demo, and then we can have like another uh, small break. So demo for this, let's see this one. So in this case, we're using the modified version of Android. So you need the one from the training portal. Um, and here we need to do uh, to go first to insecure data storage. Share preferences part one. Here I'm going to put here my uh, username and my password. Uh, and I'm going to hit save, right? So we can see here the data is saved. And now I can go back and um, go to the SQLite uh, data. So here I'm going to put my SQLite user and my SQLite password. So I'm going to hit save on this. So now this data has been saved as well. And then with this, we are ready to go into uh, the data validations menu and start playing with the XSS, right? Because now we have some data uh, on the application. So I go here to input validations. And now here we have this internal and external storage. And you have this uh, URL uh, on the slides that you can click on, right? So I'm just using this, but it's basically the same thing. So I'm going to do first um, all the first payloads on the first field. So I'm going to do this here. And then I'm going to do the other ones. I'm just going to do the app stealing. in here so i can copy several copy this uh, actually i think we could copy the the whole thing some won't work because i don't have well okay i'll just leave it here here so let's try like this so here i'm going to paste the others 
So first we have the more kind of basic XSS checks. So we see hello is bigger. We get the alert one, right? So uh, we have XSS because we have alert one. Then the location is showing us the URL from where this is being loaded from. So we have a file URL, so we should get excited. Maybe we can read local files. Uh, and this is the full path where the HTML is being loaded from, right? So this gives you some interesting information. Uh, and this is the other alert one for uh, the image, right? So these are all the first payloads. And now if I click on the second, this is reading the local file. So you can see here, we are reading the XML file. Uh, of the application with uh, XSS. This would be data exfiltration of local uh, X XML files uh, using XSS, right? So we have here my username and my password. So these are the credentials that I entered when I created this XML file. And then these are um, my credentials. So my SQLite user and my SQLite password are my credentials on the uh, SQLite database. So these are the credentials that I entered. So you can see, we can read those uh, using the XSS, right? So yeah, and then some files, if you cannot read them, you will see some uh, blank window. And other files, if you can read them, you will see something like this, right? So in this case, we have an ELF. So this is the file from uh, Drawser, this uh, binary file, right? So this is a library. So I'm just going to hit go OK on this. Yeah, and I think that's the end of that. So, yeah, with this, uh, I'm going to give you like another break, maybe around five minutes. Do you have any questions before we go for a small break? Before we continue? No questions? So then I'll set up the timer. So more or less five minutes, and then we can continue because I think you have some Android devices. So you can try this exercise and then let me know if you have uh, any questions? I'm going to try to do the second floor back in approximately five minutes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to pause the recording and then we will uh, resume it from here. Any questions before we move on? Did anybody try this? Here, showing the star in the screen. Cool. Then, <clears throat> okay. Then let's move on, and I'll show you uh, now this. Now that we have seen XSS and data exfiltration on Android, it would be unfair if we wouldn't do the same on iOS, right? Because of course, this is also possible on iOS and it is easier depending on a few factors. So you will see. So now let's talk about attacking web views and data exfiltration uh, in iOS, right? Let me just double check here. We see, yeah, I think the recording good. So, um, yeah, so, when we're talking about attacking web views and data exfiltration in iOS, we need to talk about uh, UI web views, right? So there's two types, the two main types of web views in iOS, uh, UI web views and WK web views. Uh, UI web views are the old ones, which are more vulnerable by default. Uh, and the WK web views are kind of the new ones, right? So we will see uh, this explained a little bit better um, in a moment, but basically, uh, UI web views allow iOS apps to include a web view that can render HTML code. So if user input is not output encoded correctly, then attackers can uh, take advantage of this to execute arbitrary JavaScript or render malicious HTML in the security context of the app, right? So you navigate to um, the open, uh, the dumb vulnerable insecure app version two, and then navigate to web view issues. Uh, and then you can uh, click on start challenge. So you click on with the issues, start challenge, and in there we have uh, the exercise here. So here the methodology is very similar uh, to Android, right? So we are going to try first HTML tags, then script alert one, and then we will see if we can also uh, steal local files, right? So uh, with um, Mel, we can try H1 hello, we can see the hello is bigger. Um, then we can try uh, the same payload. So we can do alert one, uh, this confirms we have XSS, alert location, 
under what context is this XSS being loaded from, and then can we read local files to steal them? Right? So, for example, the the database calls of the user, right? So that database, can we steal it? Yes, no. So that is also an interesting question. We can try all these things, and this is um, how the output looks like. So we have the alert one, we have um, alert location, and in this case, you can see we don't have a file URL. We have uh, Apple Web Data. So the Apple Web Data URL uh, is basically equivalent of the file URL uh, of the file URL in terms of it allows us to uh, read local files. Again, no same origin policy, kind of a privileged URL from where we can do more damage, right? So you should also get excited when you see an Apple Web Data URL uh, in an XSS on, a, on an iOS application. Um, and then um, another thing to look at here is that you have about null. So basically the problem um, why this happens is that uh, the, the URL is actually blank of the the place where this XSS happens. And then by default, Apple defaults to the most privileged and insecure um, context, which is Apple Web Data. But this all happens just because the developer didn't specify the URL. So you will see this uh, now when we look at the source code, when we look at the root cause, right? So it's in quite interesting. So you have here the alert one, uh, then alert location, Apple Web Data. So interesting, ability to read local files. And here we have, the possibility of reading, uh, you know, the cellular usage. So we can read some, uh, you know, SQLite databases like that from the system. So we have file access, right? So again, XSS and data exfiltration in iOS. Methodology-wise, you would normally follow these steps, right? Can we also run JavaScript and then we do the alert one? And then we can see that, yes, uh, alert location. In this case, we get Apple Web Data. So this is a privileged context, uh, not protected by the same origin policy, which means we can read local files. And then, uh, because access is uh, run from a privileged context, can we read uh, phone files and send them to an attacker? So in this case, we have, we try to read a couple of databases and we can read them fine. So this means we can steal uh, local files, right? So now to, regarding the root cause analysis, uh, we need to talk about the, the web views uh, in iOS, right? So a possible way to to find out uh, this right so as you, as you do in the code review let's pretend you have the swift uh, source code so you could you need to look for wk web views and ui web views right so this issue could happen on both but it will be much more likely if the views are ui web views so you have to grep for both so you do for example egrep which is a regular expression uh, kind of grep and then you grep for uh, files containing uh, either wk web view or ui web view and then you search and then you pipe this to filter out only um, files that are we have a swift extension so that you get a bit less noise and here we can see the files where this application is uh, calling this kind of views right so you can take a look and see uh, if there's anything uh, you know insecure being done in there so we can get we say we get some results in here so if we inspect the first file uh, thoroughly we can find this right now this is very interesting because um this is the swift source code for uh, the xss uh, and you can notice here that uh, the name uh, in the um, syntax highlighter that we use for this is not shown in a different color it's shown in the same color as the hello and the rest uh, so you don't really see that this is actually a string concatenation in swift because the the um, uh, you know, the syntax highlighter didn't understand Swift, so it didn't highlight correctly. So this is going to happen to you if you use any sort of IDE that is not familiar with Swift. Maybe, yes, some some certain words will be highlighted, but not the string concatenations in the same way that you will see them a little bit faster uh, visually on, on Xcode, right? So this is the problem. So we have a string concatenation of user input inside of uh, a string that is not sanitized uh, and then passed to load HTML string. So very interesting uh, iOS thing to look for. Um, if user input ends in here, then you could have XSS in iOS. And then another very interesting thing is that the base URL is nil. So this means there's no URL for this web view, which means the, the web view is much more privileged. So the web view is really running from Apple Web Data, which means uh, we can read local files uh, and so on. Also, 
since this is a UI web view, this is actually the default uh, settings, right? So uh, in this case, the developer does not have to add any insecure settings. This is like the default UI web view uh, behavior in iOS, right? So very scary. So here you can see um, what it would look like in Xcode, right? So you would navigate to the file once you find it. And then uh, in here, you can see that the syntax highlighter is showing the name in a different color. So this is because um, the color is telling you that this is a string concatenation. This is actually concatenating the name variable into the string that is going to be uh, rendered uh, in the HTML, right? So this is the XSS. And when you use Xcode, you can see this more quickly because Xcode understands Swift, right? And the other thing is the base URL because the base URL is nil. This means it will default to Apple Web Data. So uh, our XSS will run from an Apple Web Data context, which, which can do more damage, can read local files and so on. So um, you can see in the vulnerable source code, uh, user input is concatenated into a string without prior sanitization. So that is uh, what causes the XSS. And the WebView URL, base URL is set to nil, which means the WebView will run with higher privileges, hence enabling data exfiltration from the phone. Now, this issue is in part possible due to the fact that WebKit allow universal access from file URLs and WebKit, WebKit allow file access from file URLs. These two settings are turned on by default on UI web views, right? So this is very important, right? These two uh, insecure settings are turned on by default on UI web view to this day, right? So anytime you see a UI web view and the, the URL is Apple web data or file something, then you should get excited because if it's a UI web view, chances are you will be able to, um, you know, use the XSS for data exfiltration purposes, right? So this has all been disabled by default on the new um, web views, the WK web views, but you can still uh, set these settings to insecure settings on WK web views and, and still shoot yourself in the foot as a developer, right? So if this does not mean that the issue is completely removed. Uh, the developers just have to do a little bit more work uh, for this to happen, but it is still possible. Right? The, the scary thing is this is the default behavior on the UI web views, which are still used to this day, right? So, um, so yeah, if you're a developer, try to use WK web views and don't use UI web views. Um, and then also, of course, you should output and code user input prior to concatenation uh, and turn off JavaScript entirely on the on the um, on the web view if possible, right? But uh, another important thing is um, uh, turning off JavaScript entirely on the UI web view uh, actually is not possible. You need to you need to use the WK web view for that. So the UI web view, even it has like all the insecure settings enabled by default. And also you cannot even turn off JavaScript on this one. You have to use the WK web view for that, right? So this is just another reason to use WK web views. I think they are also improved and faster. So there's really no reason to use the UI web views anymore. But if you find them in any test, uh, you know, it could be, you could do like some damage. Let's do a demo of a bit. You mentioned um, you have no um, iOS device, so we will then just move on after this. But yeah, this is the Dumb Vulnerable Secure app. So now I'm going to go into, um, let me see, where is this? Web view issues start challenge and now i'm just going to paste uh, all the payloads in here so we have image source section error alert one pg on load alert location and then we request a couple of files right so i'm just going to paste this in here paste and then when i hit return now we should start getting alerts right so now, first we're getting the, now JavaScript is asynchronous, so you may not get the alerts in the same order that you paste it, but that's fine. So I'll just explain what, it, what each alert is. So in this case, we have the alert location. So we can see that the URL is Apple Web Data, and we also see the iOS token in there. So this could be interesting uh, in situations that you want to exfiltrate local files because by revealing the, uh, you know, the token, you can uh, grab the token from um, from the UR, from the location and then retrieve local files. We will see some examples of this uh, from the field uh, in a moment 
index points, right? Uh, so that is nice. Then this is the actual alert one. And this is the, you know, reading a SQLite uh, database uh, from the phone, the phone calls, I think. And this is the other one, right? So, so yeah, this is data exfiltration with XSS uh, on iOS. So we give you a little bit of a taste of the course. Uh, and now um, let's continue with more clear text HTTP on iOS. So does anybody see what the problem is here? Give you maybe 15 seconds. CSS loaded by by HTTP plus cached CSS equal permanent XSS. Perfect, perfect, very good. Again, excellent level uh, in the audience in this workshop today. Very good. So yes, this um, this is the problem, right? So the application requests and caches the CSS file from the server. So you can see the request is done over clear text HTTP, and the server always replies with not modified. So if you modify the, the file once, uh, you can change this reply instead of not modify to say, okay, and then provide your crafted um, CSS. And then this CSS, you can see it's here, server provided CSS is actually appended into the source code uh, in here, right? So um, this is the actual XSS. So what can we do with this? We are inside of, um, you can, this is a little bit weird because of the placeholders, but basically, this is putting the server provided CSS inside of the style. So we have HTML style, and then this is concatenating here the server provided uh, CSS. So the attacker can supply a CSS file using a clear text mine in the middle, right? So we can close the style, and then we can do a script source, and then specify an attacker controlled uh, page where we have our JavaScript. And then we finish the script, and we open another style. So HTML is fine, for example, right? So then this is very cool, right? Because now the attacker has achieved a permanent XSS where uh, the payload is actually on a, an attacker controlled server. So you can keep changing this, this JavaScript all the time and the application will always retrieve it. Uh, so every time a user of the application opens the application, then this attacker uh, JavaScript file will be retrieved uh, and executed. So this is very handy because it will be very messy to like do an, a different injection each time here and try to see what you can get and so on. So it's easier to just host it all in your own uh, domain and then just change this file as many times as you need to uh, until things work the way you want, right? So uh, in this case, we have this permanent XSS. So we have basically provided a fake uh, CSS file, which is basically uh, loading this uh, attacker controlled JavaScript from an attacker controlled uh, web server, right? So the XSS payload will be executed every time the user reads an article. This was a news uh, application, right? What can we do? A lot of things, right? So one possibility, we can read uh, the user activity. So we can have like X, uh, an XSS payload like this inside of our JavaScript file. Now, since this is on attacker.com, we don't have to mess with man in the middle or with the application anymore. So we can just change this JavaScript anytime we want. And here we can uh, have like a logger that gets like the cookie, the location, the title, the body in it, HTML and everything else. So this is like retrieving all data and sending it to, uh, to the logger, right? So it waits uh, one second for the page to load and then sends all this information to the attacker. So the logger gets something like this, the IP address, user agent, cookies, URL, HTML of the news that the user was reading from the app, right? So really scary stuff, right? So you can basically get all the activity uh, of a user with a permanent access. Then another thing that happened in this application is when you favorited the articles, then they were loaded from a file URL. And now you know iOS, file URL, uh, UI web view means, uh, you know, data exfiltration with XSS. So in this case, uh, then we can uh, try uh, to read some sensitive files. So this was the payload. So this is like looping through the sensitive files and try to retrieve 
each of them and then you got this uh, alert go database uh, of uh, you know the contents of the database and then you could also send them to an attacker so this is the logger and then you can like encode like a cookie the location and the sensitive files uh, and so on right so you can basically read local files send them to an attacker uh, and all this right so this is the alert uh, of reading the call history of the user for example uh, and then another thing is what I mentioned before, like sometimes you can read these random tokens from uh, the URL. So if you have uh, the these random tokens that iOS uses in the URL, you can get them from JavaScript. So you can do var token path replace, and then you get the location. Uh, you can the token from the location. So you get got here like alert go token, and then with that you can go for sensitive files uh, inside of the application itself. With the token right so this is uh, the part that got the token and then from there you can retrieve the files right so how do we fix this right so avoid usage of clear text http to download files consider pinning uh we explained this before validate the file from the server so if you're retrieving a css file then it should be a css file it should not contain html and so on right so you should validate that the css file is really a css file and then if possible Prior to concatenated strings, uh, output and code uh, HTML characters in, in CSS files before merging with HTML. Then avoid loading pages with untrusted input from a file protocol. Um, like this, in this case, it was the trusted or the favorite uh, news articles were being loaded from a file URL. So you should try to avoid that. And then favor uh, UI text views over UI web views where possible and then disable JavaScript if possible, right? Then if JavaScript must be enabled, consider CSP to limit uh, JavaScript as much as possible. And then if you actually have to somehow allow uh, HTML from users, then at least sanitize it prior to rendering. So Q53 has a very nice uh, library, Don't Purify. This is a, a partner company, just full disclosure, but this is a free tool that a lot of websites use, right? So anybody can use this for free. So uh, let's see more data exfiltration attacks, right? Now that we have seen data exfiltration with XSS. Now, this is another example of a browser application. Uh, and then we have an exported activity that offers browsing functionality. So the application has some functionality that expects other apps to send URLs to it because it's a browser, so it opens URLs. It opens those URLs and shows them to the user, right? So interesting stuff. And then this is the an implicitly exported activity. So you have here uh, the name of the activity is dot browser, and then this is the intent filter, uh, right? So nothing uh, very interesting there. And then the way it works is actually with an intent extra. So again, you need to look at the source code uh, sometimes to find how to how to call this, right? So in this case, um, this was searching for uh, a query intent extra. And then this query intent extra is was treated as the URL, and then it just goes ahead and opens it, right? So this is the validation of the URL. So there was a, an exported activity. Uh, we have an intent extra. And then this is the URL validation that the application is using to uh, validate uh, this intent extra, whatever URL is sent to it from another app. Can you see any problems in this regular expression? Any guesses? No problems in this regular expression? Come on. No? You don't see like anything dodgy here? Okay, well, in this case, you can see me and hear me, right? So in this case, um, the problem is there's some things here that can be problematic, right? So this is allowing JavaScript URLs, data URLs, file URLs, right? So specifically the file URL is very interesting, right? So in here, 
uh, with if we can send a file URL. Now, you know, file URLs are more interesting for XSS, so we can fool the application to go to the SD card using a file URL and then steal the databases of the application, right? So how could this look, right? So you would write um, an HTML file on the SD card. Now, any application on the phone with SD card privileges can do this. So you basically write your own HTML file uh, that has all the XSS, all the nice XSS inside. And then you send uh, a, a file URL to the victim application. So you put the intent extra that the application is expecting the query, and then you start the activity, but you send it to this uh, HTML that you control on the SD card. So with this, we can then, uh, you know, specify which is the location of the database for the databases, then the database files that we want to steal. And then we just look through this and retrieve all the files and then send them to uh, an attacker control website, right? So this is again a data exfiltration with XSS, but a little bit different. In this case, we're using a DSD card for this, and this is the whole example from real pandas, right? So in this case, we got here, like got the database, and then we have like the cookies, uh, and so on, and many other files could be stolen as well, right? So how to fix this? Uh, do not accept file URLs if possible. So if you have a browser application, probably you want to open HTTP and HTTPS URLs, but you should not open file URLs. Then you could set uh, web view settings that allow file access to false, uh, which disables uh, file system only, but defaults to true. Then set allow file access from file URLs uh, set to false. So this disables file access from file URLs. This defaults to false since Android 4.1. So a little bit less secure, uh, more security than uh, iOS uh, UI web views, right? Since uh, a much older version of Android, uh, given that WK web views are relatively new on iOS. Uh, and then uh, web view settings that allow universal access from file URLs should be set to false, right? So this disables access to content from any origin from file URLs, which defaults to false since Android 4.1, right? So this is a link uh, for more details about that, right? So this is how you would go about fixing this. Now let's talk about that interesting uh, iOS application. So here we had a permanent access with data exfiltration. It was interesting because the application was encoding correctly uh, incoming messages, but it did not output encode outbound messages, right? So if the user types something on the chat, the user could access themselves. So even though this is a self XSS, you could trick a user to self XSS by copy pasting your message into the chat. So you could, for example, uh, send a message like this, like, can you copy paste this message into the chat? It seems something's not working for me, thank you. And then you put like script source and then the HTTP to an attacker control uh, IP or server, and then finish the script. And then this will load, uh, you know, the attacker control, the JavaScript every time. So the payload then uh, run every time the application was open. So this XSS was uh, persistent because the application is a chat application. So it wants to show you uh, all the previous chats, right? That you had on the, on the application when you open it. So by doing that, it was uh, launching this XSS and then, uh, you know, you had this permanent uh, XSS on the application. So this was pretty cool, right? But this just goes to show you that you should always uh, output and code input from all locations, not just uh, the sender, but also, um, you know, not only the, the people that sends you the message, but also for messages that you send uh, yourself, because otherwise things like this could happen with copy paste and so on. So with this, uh, again, we like define like some uh, files to steal and then look through this and we were able to uh, steal all these files and send them uh, to an attacker. So this is a screenshot of that at the time. How to fix this? Output and code user input from all locations. So uh, in the URL, the chat input sent to others, the chat input sent to self, right? So this is what was missing in this case. The chat input set to self uh, was not being saved. The database, and yeah, better be safe than sorry, right? So try to always uh, output and code more uh, than less. Uh, where in doubt, output and code, right? Now let's talk about some um, crypto attacks. So this was a crypto messenger uh, Android application. So does anybody see a problem with this? This is an application that receives encrypted files uh, from users. Does anybody see the problem? Let me 
see. I'll just wait for you to type something in the chat. I don't want to cover it. So let's give you maybe 10 more seconds, 15 more seconds. Try to find some problem here. Nobody? Okay. In this case, uh, the problem was that the application was using the original file name when creating a new file on the system, right? So we have save file and then input URI, original file name. And here you can see that the original file name is being saved uh, as the target file without any sanitization. So what can we, what can we do with it, right? So you could have a malicious attacker send you an encrypted file like this uh, with, uh, you know, you dot dot slash your way out of wherever, and then you specify a, an original file name that has, uh, you know, is whatever file name you want. So we have an arbitrary file write with the path traversal, right? And then when user B receives and decrypts this file, then um, the, this will result in user A controlling uh, and overwriting any file in the app storage, right? So you can specify any file you want and the contents of the file uh, in the, the decryption. So uh, this was a pretty uh, cool attack that allowed you to do an arbitrary file, right? So pretty nice. Okay, now let's look at uh, an application that was implementing PGP uh, in iOS, um, and it was doing so in JavaScript, right? So pretty cool, right? So that's anybody see the problem here. If for this one, Maybe 20 seconds. Any guesses about what's wrong with this? Private key and passphrase. Uh, yes, but what is the problem with the private key and the passphrase? The application needs the private key and the passphrase to, uh, you know, to do the PGP in JavaScript. And that is, uh, you know, data inside of the application itself, so the attacker would not control that. But you are you kind of close, right? So this is uh, let me show you. So, so the problem here is so what this is doing, right? This is doing all this HTML append string, and then it's concatenating the private key, the passphrase, right? So this is data that the application has from the user to to do the PGP stuff, right? So the private key you need to decrypt emails, the passphrase you need to you know use the private key. So you kind of need this. Uh, and then this is the message provided from uh, the user. And this is also concatenated here, right? It says string escape for JavaScript. So it looks kind of safe. But this was actually the problem. So uh, you can, this is the message that somebody would send you by email. So the application was doing HTML append format and then var message and then concatenating the message inside of this. So you could provide a message that basically would close these single quotes and add something, right? So you can do send an email like single quote, semicolon, and then your payload. Uh, and then at the end, you put like something that, so that the JavaScript ends up being valid. So the result in JavaScript would look like this, right? So you have the private key, then you have the passphrase, and then the message would be single quote, single quote, uh, semicolon. So uh, this is already closed. And now here we can do uh, XML HTTP request, and then we can make a request to attacker.com and send the passphrase uh, as well as the private key. We could steal it the same way because passphrase and private key have already been defined as variables right above this. So we can send this uh, to an attacker. So the attacker can steal both the private key uh, and the passphrase, right? So 
if you have like a netcat listener you would see a request like uh, get my secret passphrase so you get the, the passphrase and the private key uh, of the user right so pretty cool uh, attack of course you could make this uh, a little bit um, more easy you know nicer for the attacker like for example you could include um, the email from the user that you hacked as well as the passphrase and the private key and then you would have all you need so if you have the email the private key and the passphrase um then you know you have all you need to to do the you know to impersonate the user right so you will have here different variables or you could also send a post request or something and then it would be uh, just fine right so pretty cool attack uh for doing a um remote uh, stealing of the private key and the passphrase of the user um <clears throat> using xss right so really nice uh, attack so how to fix this? In this case, you should basically for user input prior to concatenation and then encode user input in JavaScript. Funnily enough, this is the way, this was the name of the variable, right? So uh, string escape for JavaScript, that is what it should be, but it's not what it was, right? So this the string was unfortunately not escape for JavaScript, but this is what it should be, escape for JavaScript, right? So you should escape for the context in which the data is going to be used. In this case, uh, it should be safe for a uh, JavaScript context, right? So this is explained in more detail in the OWASP XSS prevention cheat sheet. So now let's talk about an application very close to my heart, uh, Smart Sheriff, right? So this, this workshop would not be complete without talking about this application. Um, government mandated app to... Um, uh, okay, so yeah, this is an application very close to my heart, uh, Smart Sheriff. So this application that I explained briefly in the intro is an application that was mandated in the entire country of South Korea. This is the Good Korea, right? Uh, the democratic one. Uh, and uh, in this country, right, people were forced by law to install this application, parents and children. And this government mandated app uh, was meant to help parents protect their children, control phone usage, control installed apps, block websites, uh, and so on. Right. So, uh, in principle, nice intentions, in practice, horrible uh, implementation. So, you can see this here. And we're going to cover just a few of the interesting bugs that we found in this sentence because, uh, you know, this workshop would be incomplete without this. Uh, I think you will have a lot. So, first time, was not using SSL at all. This is actually a relatively common pattern in some applications from China and Korea. I'm not sure why they don't really seem to like to use SSL too much. Um, and yeah, uh, they, it, basically everything was clear text HTTP. So we reported this on the first round, the first time we tested them. The report was sent to the vendor. They uh, supposedly passed everything. So the second time, uh, in round two, we say, okay, they switched to SSL, right? So uh, they they started, you know, this, wow, they, they really switched to SSL for real. So we were kind of surprised about this. Uh, and then this is how they were validating the SSL certificate. So can anybody see a problem with this? Any guesses about what's wrong with this? Always true, certificate always valid, correct. So really smart audience today here. Exactly, so that is the, that is the problem, right? So uh, on received SSL error proceed. So anytime there's an SSL validation, there's going, the application is just going to proceed. There's, there's no more logic here, there's nothing else than proceeding. So it doesn't matter what the error is, nothing matters, it's just proceeding. And then with the hostname verifier, all the verification is just returned true. So it doesn't matter if the if I give you a, a 7asecurity.com a security certificate for facebook.com, the host mismatch doesn't matter because the verify is just returning true, right? So this is the other uh, problem with this, right? So uh, really, um, really funny stuff uh, ssl man in the middle without worry so even though they switched to ssl in practice it was as if there was no ssl at all because this was like completely ignoring all ssl warnings right so it was kind of uh, fixed uh, in that they were using ssl but not fixed in terms of they introduced this uh, complete ssl uh, verification bypass right 
And then, uh, yeah, any guesses about uh, what the problem is with this, uh, what the vulnerability is, or the encryption algorithm? What encryption algorithm can you use to encrypt and decrypt? So you can encrypt and decrypt with the same function. What algorithm lets you do this? You can see here uh, clear text. Uh, this is the phone in clear text, and this is the um, uh, encrypted uh, phone number. And then this is the encrypted phone number. And then when you decrypt it, you get back um, you get back the phone number, right? But every time you are only calling uh, this encrypt decrypt function, right? So Encrypt decrypt. Uh, if you pass the clear text, then it gives you the cipher text, and if you give it the cipher text, then it gives you the plain text. So, any guesses about what the problem is with this, what the algorithm is, or anything else wrong that you notice here? We have something in XOR. Very good. So, yes, we have XOR. Uh, the fact that XOR is used is not a vulnerability in itself. Uh, I mean, XOR can be used in one-time paths, you know, so it can be a secure uh, thing if you do it properly. But in this case, the problem is that the XOR key is actually hard-coded in the application. So you can see this, the bytes here. So these are the hard-coded bytes. And then this is actually doing the XOR uh, here, right? So uh, we have a layer of encryption to obfuscate uh, phone numbers, but really the key is on the application. So anybody retrieving the application can reverse all this and therefore uh, you know there's no security at all because like anybody can reverse this and then therefore anybody can decrypt it right so we have a hard-coded xor key this is the actual uh, xor operation this is the hard-coded key here so with this we could put together a python script with the hard-coded bytes that was basically doing the encryption and decryption, right? So you can encrypt and decrypt with the same function. So we were using this script uh, during the test to figure out what is, uh, you know, uh, the encrypted and the ciphertext and the plain text for stuff. So we were using this, but basically you should not have hard-coded uh, encryption keys on the phone, uh, on the application for this reason, right? Uh, so this is the rest of our, our script. So basically we have a hard-coded XOR, um, problem here so this is the what the key was saying so moiva was the company doing this so it had like a tweak system fighting something uh, and then uh, this is the encrypted text then it goes through xor and then it gives you the phone number right so this is the xor key they had some null bytes maybe to make it harder to find uh, on the binary of the apk itself i'm not sure but they were they had like some uh, null bytes in the middle of all this so yeah, uh, hard-coded uh, XOR key, right? So first problem. Now, uh, next issue. So this was on the first time. So first round, they were using XOR. And then the second round, they started to do this, right? So does anybody see the problem here? The AES key is hard coded. Very good. Really a uh, surprise today by the uh, smartness of the audience. So, really nice to have you. So, exactly. So, this is the problem, right? So, we have uh, AES encryption. We have a, a layer of AES that was added. Uh, but uh, AES, so we have this is um, retrieving the AES key. Now it needs to be 64 uh, decoded because, of course, a, uh, the AES key is going to have like some kind of uh, you know binary kind of characters that could cause problems. So you would normally base 64 that, then you base 64 decode the key, you assign it to a string, and then this is setting the secret key to the bytes that were retrieved from here. And then this is actually using AES. So nothing wrong with using AES as, as well as nothing wrong with using XOR. Um, but again, the problem is the key is uh, hard-coded in the application. So again, anybody can retrieve the hard-coded AES key and it's just another meaningless layer of encryption. So in this case, uh, the key was saying Moiva One Cyber uh, Smart Shave something. So, uh, so yeah, this was the request, right? So when you run it through AES, then it would give you like an entire uh, encrypted uh, request. So another useless uh, AES layer 
with a static key, right? So a key that anybody could retrieve. So it's really not adding any security because anybody can read the key from the from the phone. So just to summarize the catastrophe, right? Uh, you have a phone number. This is an XORT with a key that is hard coded in the application that anybody could retrieve. So this step provides absolutely no security protection, right? So this is the first step. Then the entire request is encrypted with AES with a second uh, hard coded AES key on the application as well. So this results in the entire request being encrypted, but this layer again is useless because anybody can retrieve this key and reverse this. Then this request is sent over SSL that we saw ignores all SSL warnings. And then at the end, we had the, the response, right? So this was, uh, you know, we, we thought this was really funny to have all these, uh, you know, broken broken stuff, right? So two, two hard-coded keys that basically add some useless crypto and then ignoring all SSL warnings, right? So really, really bad stuff. So how to fix this would be to validate SSL certificate properly, consider pinning, uh, avoid hard-coded encryption keys in applications, request a key over a secure connection to the server using a server uh, public key or generate a key on the client and then send it securely to the server uh, encrypted with the server public key, right? And then save the encryption key for the user uh, safely leveraging the Android key store. So the place to store secrets in Android would be the Android key store and the place to store secrets uh, on iOS would be the iOS keychain. Right. Those are the two locations that uh, in newer versions of Android and iOS, there's actually a, a hardware back security enclave, right? So this is like uh, physically much safer uh, place to store data than anywhere else on the phone, right? So this is where, what you should be using to store secrets as well as the uh, iOS keychain for iOS secrets, right? So that will be the proper way. Uh, now let's talk about uh, interesting remote code execution attack. So we had a CRM application with Google authentication. So you have a pop-up if the user is not logged in that prompts you to log, log in with Google, right? So the user is prompted to log in with Google. And then when the pop-up closes, uh, it sends the data to the app after authenticating, right? So uh, this was being done with a deep link, right? So at this stage, you should be familiar with this. And then, um, so that's the background, and uh, this is the vulnerability. So, does anybody see what the problem is here? Can you guess it? Concatenated SQL query. Uh, you are right. Uh, we have a SQL query with a concatenation. So this means we have SQL injection in this Android application. So, whoops. so you can see it here. So we have a deep link, right? So this is the activity login web view. You can see there's no exported anywhere here, but we don't care because there's an intent filter. So intent filter means export true. Uh, and with this intent filter, this means uh, malicious apps on the phone can call this. Uh, and because this is browsable, also, we can attack this um, deep link using a website as we saw before, right? So the scheme uh, in this case has been uh, you know, changed to uh, protect the guilty. But uh, in here we have, we will be using one app for the example, right? But this was a very nice vulnerability that we found on Appentis, right? And then this is the actual uh, string concatenation. So it's updating the user credentials with a token that is received by Google. So that's what the application was trying to do. But because there's no validation at all, we could in turn turn this into SQL injection. But it is cooler than SQL injection because in fact, we could turn this into remote command execution. So you can, for example, a malicious application on the phone, you can, you know, CD into another directory, you can create any binary you want. In this example, we will just create a file full of A, so we can do echo A, -A, -A and then save this into test.so, and then we can give permission so that any other application on the phone can read this, right? So 777 is maybe too much, but let's just roll with that. So uh, we give it permissions like this, so any application on the phone can read this binary, uh, and then 
we can send a Amazon malicious application and intent like this. So we can do ADB shell and then start uh, of the application. This is this is the target uh, activity. So the vulnerable app, then slash the name of the activity, and then dash D is indicates the data of the intent that we are sending. So in this case, the vulnerable app colon slash slash and then uh, question mark and the data, and then this is exploiting the actual uh, SQL injection, right? So we have uh, the the percentage twenties, the single quotes, uh, and so on. So this is like a you know. Uh, breaking out of the SQL query. And then at the end, we have this interesting select uh, load extension, which is basically loading the binary that we created. So we can create a binary that has some code, and then we could get the application to run this binary, right? So with this, we have a remote code execution. So we could see this in Locket because of this uh, error method. So SQL Cypher uh, DL open file has bad elf magic, right? So it, it is actually trying to load the extension. So with this, we could get a code execution uh, through SQL injection in an Android app. So pretty, pretty cool attack, right? So this was pretty nice. Uh, and then another cool thing is because the activity is browsable in uh, phones running, um, you know, less than Android 6, you could also do this trick, right? So you could have an attacker uh, PHP file that uh, makes you download this test.so, right? So this is basically doing string repeat of A and then 40. So it's just going to have 40, 40 times the letter A. Uh, and then this will be saved as test.so. And then we load this in an iframe uh, in our uh, attacker page. Then this is the payload. So you can see here the single quote and then where one equals select load extension of SD card download and test, right? We don't need the SO here because it will pick it up uh, automatically. So it will be added by uh, SQL Cypher automatically. Uh, and yeah, and then we just command the rest of the query. So first, uh, when this page loads, it loads the iframe that does the download, this iframe that is downloaded with the toe. And then after five seconds, which should be more than enough for the file to be fully downloaded. Uh, we trigger the, with a set timeout, we do document get element by ID trigger source of the second iframe to vulnerable, uh, you know, the data and then the payload with the, you know, the SQL injection. And then this also resulted in uh, this bad, has bad uh, magic uh, error message, right? So you could get a remote code execution uh, on an Android app from a malicious website, right? So this was uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah. So uh, now, one thing that I um, should mention as well, is that if you have the application, that is, that is nice, but if you can hack the server, then that can get more scary, right? So you should always man in the middle of the application, try to figure out what the API requests uh, look like, and then try to see if you can do uh, some damage uh, with that, right? So in this case, we had uh, an application retrieving files from the server. So can anybody guess what the vulnerability is here? This is a vulnerability on the server based on what the app was doing. And that is the server code. Any guesses about what, what could go wrong there? No guesses. Okay, so well, one guess. The header injection, no. Arbitrary file read, yes. So we have an arbitrary file read, yes. The problem is this uh, string replace here, right? So let me show you. So this is doing a string replace of dot dot flash and then empty. So it's trying to prevent uh, path traversals and then read the file. But uh, the problem is this is really bad, right? Because you can provide, uh, let me move this uh, maybe here. You can provide a path like this, right? So if you do dot 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 slash slash, 
then when the dot dot slash is removed, you end up with dot dot slash, right? So if you provide this dot 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 slash slash, and then you remove this part, right? So you remove the dot dot slash, you are left with dot dot slash, the first two dots, and then the remaining slash. So this technique to do string replace of dot dot slash and, and empty this, this is really bad because you can do something like this and then be able to read the arbitrary files from the server like Etsy password, right? Uh, so how to fix this? Uh, you could use a platform function that returns the file name for a path and then only use that file name. So in PHP, that would be base name. Use a platform function to verify the final URL starts with the expected directory. So in PHP, that will be real path. Very important to use the uh, strict comparison in PHP. So you would do something like if zero is different, uh, strict different than string post and then real path of uh, the directory with user input. Uh, if this is not like in the expected directory, then you uh, die with access denied. And then you could also reject dot dot sequences with a regular expression match uh, like this, right? So this is some mitigation strategies that we could use. Now let's talk about uploading files to the server. Anybody sees the vulnerability here? Any guesses about what's wrong with this? This is Python. Shell equals true. Yes, you are. You are. You're looking at the, at this right. Yes, this is really bad. You should never do shell equals true in Python, and this is the problem, right? So. When you have shell equals true, then you're basically defeating all the Python protections for command execution, right? So this was doing a user files and then there's a parameter uh, that is the PGP fingerprint. So it's concatenating this into some string and then running the command with the, making a directory with the user files. Then this is just joining all the string into a string and then just calling this uh, process be open with shell true. So basically this is a remote code execution in the file upload using the, the file name, right? So uh, yeah, so what could we do with this? Using hack vector again, a really useful uh, website from Garth Hayes. You can URL encode certain parts of the payload and then here we're doing base64 encode of other parts. So you can do uh, multiple transformations like this and then you click on convert, then it will convert. So really useful. So in this case, we URL encode uh, this part of the payload and we do a WGATE of, uh, you know, sorry, security .com or whatever domain. Um, and then we do a dollar sign who am I. So this will return the output of the who am I command into the URL requested. Uh, and then you pipe that to uh, one, two, three, right? So this is basically executing the, the command. And then we have like some other parameters, and here we have to we have to base sixty four encode it. So this is how the the whole thing uh, looked like uh, once you are all encoded and base sixty four encoded. So we can set up a shell listener, and then we can set a reverse shell one liner uh, in the attacker web route like this. So then you can do curl, and then some site. Then you can provide data, PGP fingerprint of w get. Uh, you know, attacker, uh, the attacker IP, and then the a.txt, which contains the reverse shell. And then you can do a run bash, uh, and then this reverse shell, and the rest of the thing. And then you would get uh, the reverse shell back. And then when we run who am I, we got back root. So it was the web server was already running as root. So this was pretty bad, right? Um, okay, so how to fix this? Possible avoid string concatenation, avoid calling a process be open with shell equals true. Uh, very well spotted by the audience today. Uh, Python will auto escape arguments then uh, when you don't use shell true, but you need to pass a list, not a string. So you should uh, pass like this thing between, you know, square brackets. Uh, then Python will do the escaping of all the, all the arguments. 
if you must concatenate strings, PHP and other platforms offer a shell scaping function. So scape shell arg would be the function to use uh, on PHP to scape uh, command arguments and then validate user input with a whitelist regular expression that is as restrictive as possible, right? So this part is very important. So for example, only allow letters, numbers, and dots, and then make sure the whitelist doesn't allow special shell characters like pipe or semicolon, uh, ampersand, double quote, uh, backtick, or single quote, right? So these things should not be part of your whitelist or you would defeat everything, right? Now let's talk about <clears throat> API leaks, right? So again, uh, Smart Sheriff uh, government mandated app in South Korea. So it had this thing we called affectionately the bully API. So we could, um, you know, sometimes like in every classroom, there's always, you know, normally is one guy that is, uh, you know, what this child is really nasty and he wants to see the rest of the class suffer and try to make life miserable for everybody. You've all known some kind of guy like that, right? So Smart Sheriff had this uh, API that we call the bully API. So it was an API that we, we saw it would be really useful for this kind of uh, children, right? So you have uh, the, the phone number of another child on the class, and then you can ask uh, the Smart Sheriff API, hey, I have the phone number of this child on the class. And then the API will tell you, sure, this is the parent phone number. So with this, you can already do some damage, some you know phone calls to the parent or something. But the bully guy, you really want the, the password of the parent to log in, right? Because the parent was the login, but you still need the password, right? So you are the API, like, come on, Smart Sheriff, give me, give me the, the password as well so I can log in. And yes, and the API actually gave you the, the phone number and the password of the parent. So using the phone number of any child, you could get the phone number of the parent and the password. So you could, with that, you could log in into the application and then use all these restrictions that the child can never use the phone, cannot have any applications installed and blah, blah, blah. You know, so you could get, you know, make somebody's life really miserable with this. So the universal password leak uh, really, you know, crazy stuff, right? So this is how it looked like uh, in the application. So you'd make the request, uh, you know, and get client member info, something like this. And then, so this was the whole request. Now the mobile number is encrypted with the XOR thing, but we, we explained that already. And then this was the response from the server. So you get the password, which is, uh, you know, encoded, well, encrypted with the XOR and the parent mobile. So you have the, the, par the parent uh, pin and the parent mobile in the response now they are XOR encrypted but because the key is hard coded in the app you can decrypt it uh, back to the original uh, values right so we had a script and because you know the application was mandated in the entire country you could like try phone numbers at random and get a lot of uh, you know phone numbers and then you can see if the phone number belongs to a child or to a parent and if it belongs to a child what is the uh, password and the, so what is the parent number and the parent password uh, and so on as well as the parent of the actual child as well i think so it was really you know uh crazy stuff yeah that you know that this was mandated in the entire country and it was like so insecure like you can log in as anybody's parent right now this uh, smart sheriff application had a cousin application called smart dream so this was looking for uh, harmful words. So for example, if the child was talking to another child and saying something like like sex or whatever, menstruation, I don't know, something, you know, that parents could think that it would be sensitive, you know, or suicide, whatever, right? Words like this, uh, if, so if they, if they used any of the words in a database that they had, then this message would be saved on the API server, right? So it's kind of sneaky because they used the abused functionality intended for text to speech. So it registered uh, itself as an accessibility app to gain access to SMS and cacao talk messages. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, it saved all these messages with harmful words uh, on the um, on the Let's do a demo about this. Let me see. Yeah, I'm going to do other demos as well. So. Uh, so we tested them twice, right? So uh, when we gave the talk, we showed this, like the actually the the XSS was indexed by Google. So you could actually click on the result uh, in the Google results and see the alert popping out as you just saw there. You can see here uh, the alert payload. And then when you go to view source, 
you can see here uh, that we got here the, the injection, right? So this is like closing the single quote, you know, and then just putting something there and we get the alert one, right? So you really screwed up when even Google indexes the vulnerabilities in public reports, right? So uh, this was a really funny one. And then this is the one um, with the uh, passwords, right? So this was trying to uh, get uh, random train uh, random phone numbers uh, in in South Korea, right? So you have the parent phone number with the password, and the child phone number with the password, and the parent number. So you 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 could get all this, right? So this was really uh, crazy that you could uh, get so many, right? So if I skip ahead a little bit, you can see, uh, you know. It took a while, but you can get like a lot of like random people's phone number. And if you know the phone number, you can get the parent phone number. And then from the parent phone number, you can get the password. So it's really crazy stuff. Uh, and then Smart Dream. So this was, uh, it was possible to see all the messages that were, that contained harmful words, right? So you can see here violence, harassment, uh, you know, desperate, threat, kill, and things like this. Now, uh, we replace the characters uh, in this with uh, random Korean characters. So, you know, so that, the, you know, whoever knows Korean uh, doesn't see what the, these people wrote in here. But still, uh, you know, this was pretty, you know, pretty bad. Like you can see like all the messages containing harmful words from any phone number. You could dump the, all the messages from the server, right? So this was, uh, you know, really bad. Okay, so this gives you some idea. Um, yeah, we should be wrapping up. Soon. So, how to fix this? Uh, you should uh, limit access data, access to data based on user permissions, centralize security controls as much as you can, and then limit database queries based on who the user is. Uh, and you should do this in a centralized way. So, you know, for example, you have like a, an active record implementation that checks, that enforces some, you know. Uh, access control uh, permissions and then if everything goes through this active record this ensures the the security control is centralized right so you don't want a lot of if else's around the source code you want you know just a single place for every security control as much as you can so that things are easy to maintain and so on so uh, another thing would be to automatically add database query clauses uh, that filter database queries based on who the user is right so this would be a, another way to do it uh, as opposed to the active record implementation that could be more maybe an OEM approach, you could also do it with a SQL approach, um, you know, adding like a, a specific extra query clauses that ensure the results that is limited depending on who the user, who the logged in user is, right? So with this, this is the end of uh, the workshop. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have, we have. If you want, we have like uh, around five minutes for questions. We are delivering a session for 44 con uh, this afternoon. So if you are interested, you can you can email us for access uh, at admin at security.com. Do so quickly because it starts at 3 p.m. If you are interested in that and. And yeah, if uh, you're watching this on YouTube and you want access to the slides, the vulnerable apps that I used in the demos and so on, just email admin at 70security.com and we will give you access to all that for free. And with that, are there any questions? Let me check. Great fun, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so let me know if there's any questions and if not, we can maybe wrap it up here. Okay, one question. Um, my setup for assessment. So this is going to depend a little bit on what the assessment is, but basically um, I would normally try to test on an Android uh, 6 device because it's it kind of makes uh, man in the middle a little bit easier than the others. And also you should try to test on the lowest uh, Android version that is supported by the app where possible because, uh, you know, it will be, the, the security findings will be a little bit more relevant, right? So if you use the latest Android version, then you have the latest security features. So, 
maybe there's some issues that they affect the application, but only in older Android versions. So I always try to test like on the, you know, on, on an Android 6 is normally a good balance. Like most applications are going to support it still because it's still quite uh, broadly used. And then on, um, so where possible I do that, but then sometimes these applications that need a newer Android version, sometimes I got one that is require Android 9 or Android 8. In that case, I would use maybe a, a phone that I would root it. Uh, now, of course, we don't have time here to explain too much about that, but uh, you can go to XDA developers or just Google how to root my device XDA developers. They have a lot of good tutorials. Very important is to get a phone that uh, has a, a public guide about how to root it and with a lot of people having success with it. <laughs> so always try that. Some good options are uh, Google Pixel devices uh, tend to be a little bit friendlier uh, on that kind of stuff. Then on iOS, uh, I would normally prefer to test on a, a jailbroken device because it gives you a lot more access. But sometimes if uh, this is not possible because of time constraints and, you know, maybe the application has very heavy uh, jailbreaking detection and we don't have enough time to work around it, then another option is sometimes to, uh, you know, use uh, pre done objection and patch the application and run it on a non jailbroken device. Um, so that would be the main thing. And normally on iOS, I would test now on iOS 13 jailbroken tools at this at the point at, at this point in time are a little bit more stable on iOS uh, 13 12 has come out recently so the the jailbreaking tools still need to catch up a little bit but yeah that would be uh, my main setup we we we, <laughs> we cover this in a little bit more depth uh, during the course but hopefully that was enough of an intro you're using physical devices yes Especially for iOS, uh, I only use uh, physical devices. And on Android, I would prefer Motion where possible. But if Motion doesn't work, then I would fall back to, you know, some uh, rooted Android device. But Genymotion, I like Motion because it just gives you, you know, everything you want. Uh, and then you can, like, clone the devices and so on. So it's kind of easier sometimes to do certain things. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you for your time. I think we are out of time, so I'll stop the the recording now. And I hope you have a, a fun uh, rest of uh, OWAS Check Day uh, in there. And be safe, everybody, with the pandemic and so on. Thank you.